Здравствуйте, дорогие друзья! Лео Толстой is perhaps the greatest Russian writer of all time, if not the greatest writer ever. He is a towering figure in Russian literature. His masterpieces, such as War and Peace and Anna Karenina, always make the list of the best novels of all time. In this very long video, I'll look into Tolstoy's life, his major novels, his philosophy, and much more. In the first section, I'll compare Tolstoy to the giant of English literature, Charles Dickens. They lived around the same time, more or less, so this comparison can give those in the English-speaking world a window through which they can understand Tolstoy's life and writing style. In the second part, I'll discuss Tolstoy's two masterpieces, Anna Karenina and War and Peace, in great detail so you get to understand Tolstoy's mastery of storytelling and his unique insights into the Russian society of the time, but more importantly, his insights about the human condition. In the third part, I'll discuss some life lessons we can learn from Tolstoy as well as a few storytelling techniques. In the final section, I'll compare Tolstoy with another giant of Russian literature, Fyodor Dostoevsky, to give you even more depth about the man through their similarities and differences. By the end of this video, you will know Tolstoy as if he was your wise old grandpa who had amazing stories to tell and a lot of wisdom to share. You will also learn a lot about Russia and its literature through the lens of a giant who dominates Russian literature. Charles Dickens was a poor city boy, while Leo Tolstoy was a country gentleman. Dickens wrote weekly and monthly soap operas of his day that entertained thousands of people, while Tolstoy wrote epic long movies that questioned history and social institutions like family. Dickens believed in opportunities in life, therefore was optimistic, while Tolstoy believed in mystical forces within the soil and history therefore was fatalistic and pessimistic. Dickens characters are mainly boys looking up to the future and dreaming of fortune, while Tolstoy's characters are men looking inside for meaning and purpose in life. Dickens's tales are overly sentimental, while Tolstoy's tales are overly moralistic. Okay, let's compare the two giants. Egalitarianism became a dominant philosophical enterprise in the 19th century, especially after 1840s. The most famous example is of course Karl Marx, who argued for total equality. In the 18th century, the Enlightenment philosophers like Rousseau, Voltaire and others believed that humans were equal, at least on paper. But then the Industrial Revolution in Europe showed the stark inequality among people. To compound that, warfare showed the sacrifice of ordinary soldiers was not recognized, yet the glory went to the leaders, generals and kings. There was outrage and anger among the 19th century thinkers, but novelists captured this inequality in their writing too. Two of the most famous writers who lived in this period are Charles Dickens and Leo Tolstoy. Charles Dickens is perhaps the greatest English novelist of all time. No English writer has captured the imagination of English readers as much as Dickens. His novels such as Great Expectations, A Tale of Two Cities, A Christmas Carol are read by nearly every English man or woman. If Shakespeare pioneered English literature, Dickens perfected the art of storytelling through dramatization. Similarly, Leo Tolstoy and Fyodor Dostoevsky are two towering figures of Russian literature. While Dostoevsky's style is more psychological, Tolstoy is more sociological, as a result more comparable to Dickens. Of course, Tolstoy came a few years later, so he had the advantage of reading Dickens. In fact, Tolstoy used Dickens as an inspiration to write. He had a photo of Dickens in his study as a guide, a guru who motivated him to keep writing. Tolstoy's first three novels, Childhood, Boyhood and Youth, are modeled on Dickens's David Copperfield. But then Tolstoy traveled to France and got to know Victor Hugo and perhaps Gustave Flaubert, the father of realism, so he adapted realism as his style. Dickens' style combines fairy tale of fortune with the harsh reality of concrete colliding with steel during the Industrial Revolution in England. There's been a lot of comparison in recent years. For example, Intelligence Squared had a big discussion with some famous actors comparing the two giants. 
I think the main reason they are compared is their focus on social justice. Dickens wrote about the English poor of the Industrial Revolution, while Tolstoy wrote about the underprivileged soldiers and peasants in Russia. Dickens wrote about economic inequality, while Tolstoy wrote about the historical injustice of only a few people getting recognition while the sacrifice of others are forgotten. Dickens wrote about the ugly side of the Industrial Revolution, while Tolstoy wrote about the ugly side of history and warfare. At the heart of their writing is an egalitarian philosophy of a more just society for all. So in this video I'll compare the two by looking at their lives, novels, writing styles, themes and characters etc. At the end I'll try to answer whether today we are more Dickensian characters or Tolstoyan characters. The point of this comparison not to prove who is better but to shed light on both writers. I think we humans are hardwired to compare things for the sake of knowledge. So my attempt is for you to learn something about both authors. But first let me tell you about their lives. Life English Peasant versus Russian Count Dickens was born in 1812 in Portsmouth, some 120 kilometers south of London. Due to his father's job, he lived in various places in and around London. In 1824, when Dickens was 12, his father was sent to prison for unpaid debt. This must have been a huge setback for the family as he was the breadwinner. This mirror survived his life as his father was also in prison when he was a child for the same crime, unpaid debt. This problem with the legal system and poverty would dominate Dickens' novels. Tolso was born in 1828, some 16 years after Dickens in Yasnaya Polyana, some 200 kilometers south of Moscow. Unlike Dickens' modest background, Tolstoy was born a count, whose aristocratic family owned a huge estate and many serfs. While Dickens struggled with poverty, Tolstoy struggled with life. When he was two years old, he lost his mother, and when he was nine, he lost his father. As a result, Tolstoy grappled throughout his life with this existentialist question, what is the purpose of life, which dominated most of his novels. Dickens, a young boy, was forced to work 10 hours a day to earn a living. Aged 15, he started to work at a law office so he could continue his studies. Dickens was very bright and a very quick learner. He also learned how to write shorthand which helped him become a reporter. He quickly rose up the ranks in the media world. Alongside being a journalist for various newspapers and magazines, he also started writing short stories. His intelligence and hard work allowed him to move up the socio-economic ladder quite rapidly. This is the Industrial Revolution in England and the British Empire at its height of power in the world. So anything is possible if you put your mind to it. Unlike Dickens, Tolstoy was a sloppy student. He quit his university's Oriental Languages degree. When life is hard, it toughens you up. When life is easy, you create your own dramas in your life. Tolstoy was a wealthy young man, did what most of his station would. He pursued women, alcohol and gambling. But after a while, he realized he needed a bigger purpose in life. He joined the Russian army in the Crimean War of 1850s to toughen up. This experience was huge for him as he later used it in his masterpiece, War and Peace. But experiencing the horrors of war also shifted his perspective towards pacifism. Now, an established journalist and writer, in 1836, Dickens, aged 24, married Catherine and together they had 10 children. So he wasn't just a prolific writer, he was also busy in the bedroom. Things were looking up for him, so in 1842 he traveled to the US and Canada, where he was like a rock star like the Beatles, so people attended his lectures and talks. After his return to England, he decided to travel to Europe for some quiet and peace. This reflection allowed him to write more serious novels. In 1846 he also met a few French writers like Alexandre Dumas and Victor Hugo. I think Balzac was too busy writing because he was a machine. Flaubert was too young or too busy making endless drafts of his novels. Dickens loved the French language, culture, but mainly wine and cheese. In 1862, Tolstoy, aged 34, married Sophia, who was 18 at the time. If Dickens had 10 kids, Tolstoy did a few better as he had 13 children. If Dickens traveled to America, Tolstoy made many trips to Europe, mainly France, where he met the same Victor Hugo in 1861, some 15 years after Dickens. Mr. Hugo must have been very busy with all these English-Russian young writers visiting him. Tolstoy's meeting with Hugo made a massive impression on him when he read Le Miserable. 
Now Tolstoy had a purpose to write a novel nobody else had written. He returned to Russia and started writing War and Peace. In 1857, when he was 45, Dickens hit a midlife crisis. Well, not exactly, but he fell in love with an 18-year-old woman. He divorced the mother of his 10 kids and went with a younger woman. They remained together until his death in 1870. Dickens had a stroke and died aged 58. Unlike Dickens seeking a younger woman, Tolstoy's crisis was mainly for life's purpose. In 1880, when he was in his 50s, he disowned his novels and confessed his religious belief. Throughout his life, he struggled for meaning, constantly moving between Schopenhauer's negation of the self and the Christian belief. In 1910, Tolstoy ran away from his house and died at a train station. He was 82 years old. Dickens supported many charities for the disadvantaged people and advocated against slavery, terrible labor conditions, and poverty among the working class. Tolstoy valued education, so he founded many schools for the Russian peasants and advocated for pacifism, universalism, and most importantly, an agrarian way of life in the country. Because for Tolstoy, true happiness was when you produce your own food. Dickens was 5'8 or 173 cm tall and preferred a more comfortable city life, while Tolstoy was 5'11 or 181 cm and enjoyed the country. Dickens was an industrial revolution success story of a poor boy becoming one of the greatest novelists, while Tolstoy was a Russian success story of a rich man becoming one of the greatest writers. Novels TV show versus movie Dickens and Tolstoy had a somewhat similar output. Dickens wrote more novels with shorter length, while Tolstoy wrote fewer but longer novels. Dickens was a serial writer, like a daytime TV soap opera. Tolstoy, however, wrote more like a long project or an epic movie. Of course, Dickens wrote for money, so he had to write regularly. Tolstoy, however, was wealthy enough to write whenever he felt like. Dickens' first novel was Pickwick Papers, published between 1836 and 37. It's about Mr. Pickwick, a kind gentleman who travels through England to learn about the country. But a misunderstanding with a woman sends him to prison for an unpaid debt, just like Dickens' father. Dickens' second novel, Oliver Twist, published between 1837 and 39, is about an orphan boy, Oliver, who is sold into apprenticeship, but he escapes the harsh working condition to join the London's underground criminals. Dickens drew on his own experience as a working boy to expose the plight of poor children in Victorian London, and as a result is considered a social protest novel. Dickens' third novel, Nicholas Nickleby, published in 1838 and 39, is also about a poor boy who has to work to support his mother, which resembles Dickens' own life as a working boy. Tolstoy's first novel, Childhood, published in 1852, which he followed with his second novel, Boyhood, two years later in 1854, and a third one called Youth in 1857, as part of a trilogy telling his own life growing up, an aristocrat while the peasants lived in poverty. It's also about his own life growing up, losing his parents and living a privileged life while the peasant had very little which made him guilty for the rest of his life. So Tolso and Dickens came from two ends of the socio-economic spectrum. In 1841, Dickens published two novels, The Old Curiosity Shop, which is about an unfortunate teenage girl trying to help her grandfather avoid poverty and Barnaby Rudge, a historical novel about a forbidden love between a Catholic and a Protestant. In 1840s, Dickens published five novellas, and most famous being Christmas Carol, about a miserly old man who is haunted by three ghosts, past, present, and future, which is very clever about time being the biggest terror in one's life. It's also Dickens' most popular work around the world, and a Christmas phenomena which, according to some, cemented the myth and legends of Christmas. Dickens, obsessed over money, saw it as a blessing but also a curse. I don't blame him, he had 10 children to feed. After his return from France in 1860s, Tolstoy locked himself in his country house to write the beast of a novel to show the French that Russians were as good as the rest of Europe. Published in 1869, War and Peace tells the story of the Napoleonic Wars of 1805 and 1812. But it's more than a novel. In it, Tolstoy challenges historians, but he also tells the story of hundreds of characters from top to the bottom, from Napoleon to some ordinary soldiers. I have a very detailed summary of the novel if you like to watch. 
In 1850, Dickens published his most autobiographical novel, David Copperfield. It is about a boy growing up in Victorian England in the age of industrial revolution and the social upward mobility. In 1852, Dickens wrote Bleak House. If War and Peace is Tolstoy's greatest novel, Bleak House is Dickens's greatest novel. Tolstoy wrote about the heroic battles and the nightmares of war. Dickens' novel is about the legal battle and the nightmare of the legal system. Like in all Dickens' novels, money is at the heart of the novel, in a long legal battle over inheritance money. John Dice vs. John Dice is a legendary legal battle that lasted decades. In 1877, Tolstoy published his second most famous novel, Anna Karenina, which is also Tolstoy's own favorite. It's about a married woman, Anna, who falls in love with an army officer and leaves her husband with disastrous consequences for everyone. In 1850s, Dickens wrote Hard Time, Little Dorrit, and his best-known historical novel A Tale of Two Cities, which is about Paris and London during the French Revolution of 1789. In 1860, he wrote Great Expectations about a young boy whose life takes a dramatic turn when he meets a convict. The story is somewhat similar to Dostoevsky's novels in a sense that even the most flawed human beings have some redeeming qualities. I included this in my top 10 English novels of all time. Dickens' last complete novel is Our Mutual Friend, about social mobility in England. Just like all Dickens' novel, it's of course about money. In 1886, Tolstoy wrote The Death of Ivan Illich, a meditation on meaning of life and death. In 1899, Tolstoy published his other big novel, Resurrection, about past guilt and the injustice of social class and the corruption of the legal system in Russia. Tolstoy's last novel, Haji Murad, published two years after his death, is about a Muslim warrior in the Caucasus. Dickens wrote 15 novels and 5 novellas, a career that lasted 33 years between 1837 and 1870. Tolstoy, on the other hand, wrote 3 enormous novels and 11 novellas, a career that lasted 42 years. Style Industrial Fairy Tale vs. Russian Realism Dickens' style of storytelling is perhaps best described as a fairy tale of the industrial age, in which young people, mainly boys, try to seek their fortune in the city, mainly London, and also abroad in the colonies. He lived during a time when upward mobility was changing the face of the highly class-based English society. People with good education and intelligence were able to work their way up the socio-economic hierarchy. Dickens himself is a perfect example. A man of modest background became one of the best-selling authors of his day. Dickens entertained thousands of people on a weekly and monthly basis. As I said earlier, Tolstoy has an advantage over Dickens because he came a few years later. By then, realism was becoming the dominant literary form. But to compound that, Russia has a harsh climate, so people are slightly tougher than the English. While Dickens wrote amazing stories with a fairy tale tinge, Tolstoy went to the heart of the matter to tell harsh realities of life that cut really deep. If Dickens is a storyteller, Tolstoy is a philosopher and sociologist, who instead of challenging the class system in England, challenged history and historians. Dickens is part of a very rich literary tradition going all the way back to Shakespeare, one of the greatest dramatists in human history. That's why Dickens' dramatic storytelling comes quite naturally. Tolstoy, however, operates in a country that has no such an accomplished literary history back then, so he takes up the challenge of putting Russia on the map of European literature. He looked up to the French, spoke the same language, so he combined French literary realism with his Russian or Eastern mysticism to create something unique. While Europe is scientific-minded, Russia has its mystical force, which he talks about in War and Peace as a catalyst for the Russians to defeat Napoleon's army, the most sophisticated fighting machine back then. So Tolstoy took up the job of becoming the Shakespeare of Russia, or something close to that. Dickens was an amazing comic genius of his day. His novels are littered with hilarious scenes, comedy of manners, misunderstanding, ironic twists, and absurdist situations. In Pickwick Papers, the ending is incredibly ironic. The man pays the legal cost, which frees him and his rival. In Bleak House, the long-running legal case is absurd, like a Kafkaesque nightmare. Incidentally, Kafka was immensely influenced by Dickens, especially in his novel America. Tolstoy, like all Russians, doesn't laugh or smile. His style is for the most part direct, gloomy, and dark. 
as his characters scramble for a place in society, but most importantly seeking for some meaning in life. Tolstoy stories are sweeping tales of countries, cities, generations of people. Tolstoy's tales are more philosophical and seek virtue, meaning and purpose. Dickens style is more optimistic about the future as his characters goals are to better their lives. While Tolstoy's style is realistic which means more pessimistic as a result. Because let's face it, real life sucks for the most part, especially if you lived in 19th century Russia. Dickens is looking at the castle from his modest shack and dreaming, while Tolstoy is in his castle looking down at the shack and feeling guilty. Dickens wrote entertaining tales, while Tolstoy wrote philosophical epics. Dickens' most famous line comes from A Tale of Two Cities, quote, It was the best of times, it was the worst of times, it was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief, it was the epoch of incredulity. It was a season of light, it was a season of darkness. It was a spring of hope, it was a winter of despair. We had everything before us, we had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven, we were all going direct the other way. In short, the period was so far like the present day. Tolstoy's most famous quote comes from Anna Karenina. All happy families are alike, each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. Here's a quote from War and Peace. If everyone fought for their own convictions, there would be no war. Simply looking at these quotes, we can see that Dickens is more concerned with the poetics, lyrical and stylistic side of writing and storytelling. Even this passage from A Tale of Two Cities is a story in itself. While Tolstoy is more concerned with wisdom, profundity and depth, Dickens' line, if you look closely, doesn't make sense. How can two opposites be true at the same time? Well, in storytelling, you can compress two different locations and times into one. You can shrink time. That's the magic of storytelling. Here's an example of Tolstoy's language from Anna Karenina when Levin is so much in love with Kitty. He so well knew that feeling of Levin's that for him all the girls in the world were divided in two classes. One class, all the girls in the world except her and those girls with all sorts of human weaknesses and very ordinary girls. The other class, she alone, having no weaknesses of any sort and higher than all humanity. Here is Dickens in Great Expectation about Pip's love for Stella. The unqualified truth is that when I loved Stella with the love of a man, I loved her simply because I found her irresistible. I loved her against reason, against promise, against peace, against hope, against happiness, against all discouragement that could be. Once for all, I loved her nonetheless because I knew it and it had no more influence in restraining me than if I had devoutly believed her to be human perfection. As we can see, both Tolstoy and Dickens describe love as perfection. When you love someone, you are blind to their flaws. You only see the good side. But what's interesting is that Tolstoy separates her from the rest of humanity, almost godlike, while Dickens is more focused on the irrational side of love of a man who would do anything to achieve his goal. Tolstoy's Levin is a bit passive, while Dickens' Pip is poised to do anything to get her. But as things transpire, Levin gets his woman, while Pip fails. So to sum up, Dickens is more concerned to tell you an entertaining story because in industrial age the customer is God. Tolstoy's style is to write a novel, make it as long as possible, pick a fight with historians and blame everything on some mystical force of history. Readers, Tolstoy didn't think the customer was always right. He was a Russian man so he didn't care what others thought about him. Dickens was an Englishman, he was very worried about what others, I mean his readers, thought about him and his stories. Dickens catered for his readers while Tolstoy catered for himself. Characters Dickens and Tolstoy's characters differ in their socioeconomic class. Dickens' tales are somewhat Cinderella type, poor people looking up, while Tolstoy's tales are about wealthy people with one eye looking down at the peasants, with the other eye looking at themselves in search of purpose. As a result, Dickens' stories are more sentimental and makes you pity them and even feel guilty as to how they are victimized by society and circumstance. Quote, in the little world in which children have their existence, whoever brings them up, there is nothing so finely perceived and so finely felt as injustice. While in Tolstoy's tales, his characters sort of accept their fate and are less likely to complain about their lives. 
Here's a quote from Anna Karenina when a man cheats on his wife and the guilt that follows. Stepan Arkadovich could be calm when they thought of his wife, he could hope that she would come around as Matvey expressed it, and could quietly go on reading his paper and drinking his coffee. But when he saw her tortured, suffering face, heard the tone of her voice, submissive to fate and full of despair, there was a catch in his breath and a lump in his throat, and his eyes began to shine with tears. My God, what have I done? Dolly, for God's sake, you know? He could not go on. There was a sob in his throat. She shut the bureau with a slam and glanced at him. Dolly, what can I say? One thing, forgive. Remember, can nine years of my life atone for an instant? At the end, she does forgive him and the couple stay married together because Russians are realistic. Of course, most of his characters are well off, but they still suffer greatly due to historical events or family expectations or even poverty. Dickens characters have a purpose to better their lives economically. Even the term Dickensian today means a kind of social climbing. Here's a quote from David Copperfield. Annual income 20 pounds. Annual expenditure 19, 19 and 6. Result? Happiness. Annual income 20 pounds. Annual expenditure 20 pounds odd and 6. Result? Misery. Tolstoy's character, however, not all, but mostly have no financial goals, so they look for something grander than money, happiness beyond the material comfort. They seek spiritual comfort. Age also plays an important role in their characters. Dickens' most enduring characters are children from disadvantaged families, mostly orphans, who chase their dream in the big city. David Copperfield, Oliver Twist, Pip and the Great Expectations are, are just a few examples. Tolstoy's characters are for the most part adults who are caught up in social and historical events. Pierre and Natasha in War and Peace, Anna and Levin and Anna and Karenina all look for happiness and meaning, but have to struggle with the tide of history or family expectation. Tolstoy famously said that all great literature is of one of two kinds, either a hero takes a journey or a stranger comes to town. So to understand Dickens and Tolstoy, I would change the quote and say all great literature is a child growing up or an adult looking back to his or her own childhood. A good example is Marcel Proust's novel In Search of Last Time, Dostoevsky's The Bronze Kromosov. In fact, the act of novel writing or fiction writing is a grown-up trying to do child play. In fact, both Dickens and Tolstoy were obsessed with children as the most beautiful period in one's life. Dickens' novels are all about children growing up, while Tolstoy's novels are about adults lost or seeking a path. Dickens' characters are shackled by poverty, so he wants the rich to share their wealth with the poor, while Tolstoy's characters are shackled by history and social conventions. The poor have no financial means, while the wealthy are stuck by norms. Dickens' characters, while hampered economically, are psychologically freer. Tolstoy's characters are the opposite. While they don't lack in wealth, but mentally they feel stifled by the social norms and family expectations, so they seek meaning from the peasant. Here's a quote from Anna Karenina when the couple finally have everything they expected. Vronsky, meanwhile, in spite of complete realization of what he had so long desired, was not perfectly happy. He soon felt that the realization of his desires gave him no more than a grain of sand out of the mountain of happiness he had expected. It showed him the mistake men make in picturing themselves happiness as the realization of their desires. For the most part, Dickens' characters are slightly more square, meaning they have little room to grow and change. In other words, Dickens' characters are either heroes or villains, while Tolstoy's characters are more fluid and able to grow on the page and they have many contradictions. In other words, his characters are neither complete villains nor complete heroes, but a mix of both, which is closer to reality. In real life, we are all full of contradictions and have the dark and light within us. I think it has to do with their styles. Dickens' style is a bit older, archaic, while Tolstoy's style is realistic. One could say that Dickens wrote many types of characters, meaning they differ from one another. Tolstoy, however, has more characters that are similar in their outlook and life. I think Dickens wrote about the other people, while Tolstoy mostly wrote about himself. In other words, he put himself in his character's shoes to animate them with the reality of the world. As we know, Tolstoy struggled with his own happiness and meaning in life. So naturally, his characters had the same struggle. Quote, 
Everyone thinks of changing the world, but no one thinks of changing himself. Tolstoy was acutely aware of the internal struggle of his generation. Because of Tolstoy's realism, George Orwell made a distinction between the two, characterizing Dickens' characters as static while Tolstoy's characters keep growing and changing. Dickens' tales make you feel good about people while Tolstoy tells you about the uncomfortable truths of life. So to sum up, Dickens tells his characters, smile boy, while Tolstoy tells his characters, why smile? These are still the stereotypes about the English and Russian people. English people smile to cover awkwardness, while Russians don't smile and don't care about awkwardness. Themes Dickens's canvas was the English Industrial Revolution, where factories smoke like cigarette addict, and more specifically the financial capital of the empire, London. While the north and middle of England had all the factories where thousands of people moved in and out with their faces blackened by the smoke, London however was covered in fog of a different sort. Here people stored their money in banks and stocks. Tolstoy's canvas is 19th century Russia, wars, rapid modernization of big cities like St. Petersburg and Moscow. But most importantly, his canvas is the debate between East and West, Russia versus Europe. While Tolstoy for the most part ignored the debate, he was not immune from it. Unlike Dostoevsky, Tolstoy is more welcoming of the West. However, his heart was always with the Russian peasants and the, ag and the agricultural class. In fact, in his novel, the deepest wisdom about the meaning of life mostly comes from the poor, peasants or servants. In War and Peace, Pierre, in his darkest hour, captured by the French army, meets a common man who rejuvenates his spirit by giving him a bigger perspective on life. Another example is in the death of Ivan Illich. Ivan is not afraid of death after speaking to his servant. Dickens wrote about the fog of the Industrial Revolution and the legal system. For example, in Bleak House, he writes, Fog everywhere, fog up the river where it flows among green airs and meadows, fog down the river where it rolls defiled among the tears of shipping, and the waterside pollution of a great and dirty city, chance people on the bridges peeping over the parapets into the into the nether sky of fog, with fog all around them, as if they were up in a balloon and hanging in the misty clouds. Tolstoy on the other hand wrote about the fog of war, gunpowder and war and peace, quote, The night was foggy, and through the fog moonlight gleamed mysteriously. Yes, tomorrow, tomorrow, he thought. Tomorrow everything may be over for me. All these memories will be no more, none of them will have any meaning for me. Tomorrow perhaps even certainly I have a presentiment that for the first time I shall have to show all I can do. And his imagination pictured the battle, its loss, the concentration of fighting at one point, and the hesitation of all the commanders. Here Tolstoy's character contemplates that his life might be over very soon. But in this passage, the fog provides a kind of security blanket in which soldiers feel safe. Quote, the fog had grown so dense that though it was growing light, they could not see ten paces ahead. Bushes looked like gigantic trees and level ground like cliffs and slopes. Anywhere on any side, one might encounter an enemy invisible ten paces off. But the columns advanced for a long time, always in the same fog, descending and ascending hills, avoiding gardens and enclosures, going over new and unknown ground and nowhere encountering the enemy. On the contrary, the soldiers became aware that in front, behind and all sides, other Russian columns were moving in the same direction. Every soldier felt glad to know that to the unknown place where he was going, many more of our men were going too. This is incredibly powerful as you can see things through the perspective of a soldier feeling comfort that he's surrounded by his fellow soldiers. Just as a baby feels safe surrounded by his parents and family. Tolstoy was no nationalist, but he saw the power of group over an individual. Tolstoy also talks about the trains smoking dashing between Moscow and St. Petersburg and Anna Karenina. Dickens wrote about how to move out of poverty and gain financial freedom, while Tolstoy wrote about surviving wars and existential meaning and happiness. Dickens wrote social protest novels, while Tolstoy protested against historians and societal expectations. In fact, the main theme of War and Peace is his, this question of great men. Historians believe that men like Napoleon, Alexander the Great, Genghis Khan are the protagonists of history, but Tolstoy disagrees. 
that they are great because of the action of all those people around them, the soldiers, the peasants, the women and children, but most crucially those who came before them and the historical events prior. What's so ironic is that Tolstoy didn't believe in great men, he himself became one. Today as one of the greatest Russian writers of all time, or even world's greatest writer. Statistics when it comes to stats on Goodreads, Dickens wins in the number of ratings and reviews, but Tolstoy wins in enjoyment. Dickens has 3.5 million ratings while Tolstoy's has 1.4 million. Dickens has 115,000 reviews while Tolstoy has 70,000 views. It's no surprise given the fact that the English language gives Dickens a huge advantage. First, there are far more English speakers in the world than Russian. Second, almost 30% of the world speaks English either as a first language or a second language. I say India reads Dickens, but people enjoy Tolstoy's work more than Dickens' work as Tolstoy gets an average of 4.07 stars, while Dickens gets 3.9 stars. Dickens' most popular book on Goodread is A Tale of Two Cities with 870,000 ratings, followed by Great Expectations with 720,000 ratings and A Christmas Carol by 710. Tolstoy's most popular novel is Anna Karenina with 750,000 ratings and followed by War and Peace with 300,000 ratings and The Death of Ivan Illich with 120,000 ratings. Now which you should read? I usually say read both but here I'll say read both but at different times. When you read Tolstoy it can get a bit heavy so to lighten up your mood read some Dickens. Previously I've said that I love Russian literature because it tells you the ugly truth. But to counterbalance that I often read one of Haruki Murakami's books to escape reality for a bit. Of course reading Dickens is not an escape altogether but he does make you feel good about the world. Also I should point out that Tolstoy is not all bleak but it doesn't shield you either. In my video comparing Tolstoy to Dostoevsky I said Tolstoy was a great mother, compassionate, generous and someone who loves kids while Dostoevsky was the brooding father seeking solitude in some underground or Siberia. Now comparing Dickens to Tolstoy, it's obvious that Dickens is more motherly as he believes in the magic of stories, the elements of fantasy and surprises in life, while Tolstoy, while Tolstoy, like a father, tells you about the harsh realities of life. But I should make it clear that Dickens wrote about children but he did not write for children. Purpose For me Tolstoy's novels have incredible philosophical and psychological depth. But Dickens' novels are greatly entertaining and funny. If you are a serious and seasoned reader and you will enjoy Tolstoy more. For me, Russian literature in general is like a punch in the face. I love it for its brutal honesty about the ugliness of the world and reality. Tolstoy confronts you to seek a deeper purpose in life. Of course, I don't enjoy his moralistic stance sometimes, but his novels open his characters, flush them out and you can see through them. While in Dickens' novel the struggle is more material, legal, external, in Tolstoy's however the struggle is more internal, existential and spiritual. As a result Dickens' novels are hopeful and optimistic while Tolstoy's novels are often hopeless and pessimistic. Dickens primarily wrote for money and Tolstoy mainly wrote for artistic expression and legacy. As a result, Dickens cares about the reader more, tries to entertain you and puts in a lot of effort to tell you a cracking story. While Tolstoy mostly has his own agenda, maybe agenda is not the right word, he is seeking a purpose for himself through his writing. But also he is a philosopher and a visionary who wants to change the world through his words. When you read a Dickens' novel, you don't know where the story is going as they twist and turn. Dickens was a genius storyteller, well he had to because his career depended on it. Every week and month thousands of people were waiting for him. When ships docked in New York people queued up or even scrambled to get their copy of the newspaper or magazine like it was Black Friday. It was a serial mania. Tolstoy on the other hand is less concerned with the story but more focused on understanding reality. In other words, Dickens was like a factory producing highly entertaining novels, as a result his characters more archetypal and fixed. He relied on his readers enjoying his books so the newspaper could get their subscribers growing. It's like a YouTuber, you always want to produce content people want to watch. So Dickens knew his readers. Tolstoy would be a terrible YouTuber. Imagine War and Peace type of content on YouTube. Dickens rode the wave of new educated people being able to read for pleasure thanks to the education system producing more readers like a factory would. 
He wrote about the Industrial Revolution, people seeking their fortune, but he also benefited from the education system. As a result, Dickens himself, a poor boy, was an industrial age success story thanks to mass education. Not only he received an education, but also mass education increased his readership. It was a win-win all around. Tolstoy published his books mostly in long format. Why? Money wasn't his concern, but of course he did get rich. He earned a lot from his writing, which became a huge problem for him. Tolstoy wanted to donate his money for some charitable causes, but his wife was fiercely opposed, hence a very unhappy family. Today, Now the question I posed earlier, are we becoming more Dickensian or Tolstoyan as characters in our own lives in today's world? We expect people to be more rounder people, meaning with more flexibility to grow and change, or the ability to have widely contradicting opinions and behaviors, because we live in a more open and accepting world, which is more in the mold of Tolstoy. But since we live in a very political and culturally polarized society, the characters visible are more Dickensian, meaning people are more stuck in their views and less flexible to change. People are either just good or just bad. At least that's how we see people in the media. Politics is characterized by Dickensian personalities, heroes and villains. But I could be wrong, in real life we are more Tolstoyan. We have all the contradictions of Tolstoy's characters. We have the good, the bad, the ugly, the sublime all inside us. But when it comes to displaying those, we only show the good side on social media, which skews our perception of others. So in private, we are Tolstoyan, round, contradictory, happy, miserable. But in public, we are Dickensian, fixed, square, and always heroically happy, and others are labeled as this or that. When young, we have a more rigid way of seeing the world, but as we grow old, we become to accept people's contradictions, life's nuances, and seek greater meaning. So in our early years, we see the world through a Dickensian lens, and later in life through a Tolstoyan lens. Another important distinction is that I think, unlike Dickens' character, most people in the West or rich countries suffer not from poverty or lack of food, but quite the opposite. People suffer from overeating. 30% of English people are obese according to Health Survey England in 2019. Has food become too cheap? No, I think it's something else. We are missing something else, so overeating is not because we are hungry, it's because we are hungry for some purpose in life, which is more in line with Tolstoy's writing. I'm lethargic, but we are also hooked to shopping and social media and our search for some recognition and meaning in life. So overeating, alcohol, and social media distraction are coping mechanism for lack of greater meaning or purpose. I could be wrong. Another big trend is urbanization. Dickens' characters went to the city to seek their financial fortune. Globally, more people are moving to the city, but among the rich, however, the trend is in the opposite direction. Rich British people move to the countryside. Tolstoy's characters saw their future in the soil, in the country, among the peasants, and close to nature. In fact, Tolstoy lived most of his life in his country state, Yasnaya Polyana. In the city, we see all kinds of people, therefore we are meant to show compassion. Dickens' prose seek our sympathy and compassion for the disadvantage in the city, where the poor and rich live side by side. In the countryside, life is a lot tougher, so Tolstoy talks about some mystical force of nature that gives your life meaning so you don't despair over poverty. Here's a quote from Tolstoy's family, Happiness. A quiet, secluded life in the country with the possibility of being useful to people to whom it is easy to do good and who are not accustomed to have it done to them. Then work, which one hopes may be of some use. Then rest, nature, books, music, love for one's neighbor. Such is my idea of happiness. Anna Karenina by Leo Tolstoy, published in 1878, is his most popular novel. Tolstoy himself called Anna Karenina his first true novel, though published eight years after his masterpiece, War and Peace. First, what is the novel about? Who are its major characters? Why was Tolstoy obsessed with the theme of family? What is Tolstoy's view on happiness and fulfillment in life? And finally, what is the role of railway in this novel? Summary Part 1 
the first thing you should know is that Anna Karenina is about romance and family life. The novel begins with one of the most famous first lines in literature. Happy families are all alike. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. The novel centers on three important married couples. Anna and Alexei Karenin in St. Petersburg, Dolly and Steva Oblonsky in Moscow, and Kitty and Kostya Levin in the countryside. But the crafty Tolstoy also throws a wild card into the mix. In the shape of a charming bachelor officer, Alexei Vronsky, who steers things and destabilizes the lives of these couples, and even questions the institution of marriage. All these people are aristocrats, so there is no Cinderella fairy tale of poor marrying rich here. It's all rich people having real troubles with their marriages. Let's start with the least important couple. It's Dolly and Steve Oblonsky who have a rocky marriage due to Steve's affairs. But Dolly eventually forgives him and they remain married. They live in Moscow, the city that is still has that old Russian charm, a bit warmer and friendlier than St. Petersburg. Tolstoy used Dolly and Steva to teach the other two couples a lesson, by virtue of their mistakes, but also through mediation and go-between. The second couple is Kitty and Kostya Levin, who when we meet are not married, who start on a very rocky grounds, but despite their difficulties, they are perhaps the most content couple in Anna Karenina. Also, Levin of this novel is Leo or Lev Tolstoy himself bookish, philosophical, awkward, not so handsome, but who works really hard to be a better person, a better husband and better citizen. Even his name Constantin means constant, a man who constantly tries to strengthen his foundation. They live in the country like Tolstoy himself, with life being slightly simpler. Now the most important married couple in the novel is Anna and Alexei Karenin. Anna is incredibly beautiful, and Karenin, her husband, is a career-driven man with an important government job, who takes his duties extremely seriously to the point that Anna is bored of him, as though she is married to an investment banker today, or some computer nerd, not romantic, not passionate, and not adventurous. They live in St. Petersburg, the most westernized Russian city, so climatically and culturally cold and bureaucratic, but they have an eight-year-old son, Sergei. Then comes the bachelor Vronsky on a white horse like some medieval knight in a shiny armor who snatches Anna away from Karenin. Vronsky is a horse racing army officer, whom Dostoevsky describes as a man who cannot stop talking about horses. In today's world, he is like a man who drives a Ferrari or Lamborghini. Before expensive cars, men rode horses to attract women. So the arrival of Vronsky steers two major characters in the novel. First, it's Kitty, who Levin wants to get married to, but Vronsky, like the bad boy of his day, doesn't want to deal with a single woman. He is after a bigger prize. He wants Anna, a married woman. Now we have drama, heartbreaks, and even tragedies. So we have our fourth couple, Anna and Vronsky, unmarried and shunned by society, who become the most adventurous of all couples in the novel. As they escape Russia to Italy and back to St. Petersburg, then to countryside, then to Moscow, but they find no place of peace. The old saying, a rolling stone gathers no moss. Vronsky being a soldier is like a nomadic person, while very attractive, also destroys Anna's psyche. Anna Karenina has several parallel stories. The main plot centers on Anna who leaves her husband Karenin for another man, Vronsky, so we have a love triangle. The second story is Levin's marriage to Kitty, but it's the story of Anna and her lover Vronsky that will be the focus of this summary. We meet Anna at a train station where she witnesses a man falling to his death in front of a moving train. This is like Chekhov's gun, that if you show a gun in the first scene, it must go off by the end of the story. Also important to note that trains were very new in Russia at the time. Here, Anna also meets the handsome officer, Vronsky, who when noticing the beautiful Anna decides to generously donate money to the family of the unfortunate train victim who got killed to show off that he is a good man of good heart. Men become generous when they meet the beautiful lady, so Anna is very impressed by Vronsky. Also, women tend to like soldiers. Tolstoy also tells us that Anna's brother, Steva, is unfaithful to his wife, Dolly, so their marriage is on the verge of a breakdown. This is the second Chekhovian gun. First, a man is killed by the train. The second, Anna's brother is cheating on his wife. 
So if the brother is capable of cheating, it's possible her sister Anna is also capable of cheating. But first, Anna is a peacemaker between her brother and his wife Dolly. She tells Dolly that it's no big deal, men cheat all the time, but he still loves you. Dolly is convinced. Well, that was easy. Then comes Dolly's younger sister, Kitty, who is just 18 and ready to get married. She has an eye on the same man Anna saw at the train station, the generous army officer, Mr. Vronsky. But wait a minute, there is this guy called Levin, who sounds like Leo Tolstoy himself. A rich landowner, a large man and not best looking, but you know, reliable. Levin gets to one knee and proposes to Kitty, but Kitty rejects him and sends him back to his village, because she thinks she can do better. Meow. She wants Vronsky. Levin is a country leopard and Vronsky is a real tiger. Siberian tiger. Just kidding. But here's the tragedy, tigers don't settle for Kitty because it's too easy. Vronsky rejects Kitty and pursues Anna, a married woman instead. Anna says, I'm married. But at the same time, seeing how Vronsky ruthlessly rejected Kitty, she really wants him now. The old saying, women want a man who is capable of rejecting other women. But Anna remains strong and says no to Vronsky. So we have three rejections already. Levin is rejected by Kitty, Kitty is rejected by Vronsky, Vronsky is rejected by Anna. Everyone is heartbroken, miserable and sick. This is only the first round, seven more rounds to go. Levin returns to the countryside, Anna returns home in St. Petersburg, but now everything looks different for her. Seeing her husband, Mr. Karenin, a boring but reliable government official, there is a hurricane inside Anna. She is unsettled. To make matters worse, Vronsky follows her to St. Petersburg. The man does not take no for an answer. Summary Part 2 Ok, things move a lot faster from now on. Anna gives in to Vronsky's pursuit and they have an affair. Anna's husband, a trusting, naive man, is oblivious. Maybe a little too soft compared to Vronsky who is so strong that he actually breaks a grown-up horse. During a horse race, he falls and the animal's back is broken, so must be killed. With one life gone, another is on the horizon. Anna is pregnant with Vronsky's love child. Anna breaks the news to her husband, I'm sorry but I had sex with this man on the horse. Karenin is shocked, but he kind of knew. Here is something interesting in Russian literature, perhaps for the first time we have a new breed of Russian characters, modernized and sensible enough not to challenge his rival to a duel. Karenin thinks to himself, quote, A duel is quite irrational and no one expected of me. My aim is simply to safeguard my reputation, which is essential for the uninterrupted pursuit of my public duties. Karenin is a nice man, so he tells Anna that he will forgive her if she stops the affair. Unfortunately, nice men finish last, at least in this case. Anna continues her affair, Karenin begs her but Anna has made up her mind. She wants a divorce, damn it. Karenin has no power so he uses their son, Sergei, as a bargaining chip to get at her. But Anna is not coming back. While giving birth to Vronsky's daughter, Anna almost dies. Seeing her like that, Karenin feels sorry and decides to forgive both Anna and her lover Vronsky. Seeing such a massive gesture, Vronsky is so embarrassed for stealing such a good man's wife that he wants to commit suicide. Russians are men of their words, but Vronsky is not a good shot, so he misses the target, I mean himself, and he survives his suicide attempt. Anna also recovers from childbirth. She and Vronsky are happy together, finally. But Vronsky, being an officer, is told by the army to move to Central Asia. He doesn't want to go to Central Asia. To escape it all, here the lovers decide to leave the motherland for some freedom and pizza in Italy. Seeing them gone, Karenin tells his young son that her mother is dead. Ok, meanwhile what happened to our second tale, the romance of Levin and Kitty? After rejection, Levin takes up gardening to distract himself. I'm only kidding, he has a large country state to manage. He goes deep into the philosophy of farming and how land shapes your views, how Russians are deeply attached to their lands and how the motherland shapes the Russian identity and how Russia is so different from Europe. You get the point. Kitty however says forget Russia, forget motherland. She travels to Germany for some beer and sausage. No, she's actually quite sick after being rejected by Vronsky. While in Germany for a bit, she soon gets sick of Germany, so she returns to the motherland. 
Around this time, Levin almost marries a village babushka, I mean a peasant woman. But then he meets Kitty again, and with the help of others, they reconcile, get engaged, and soon marry. They move to the country where they have plenty of fights, they make a lot of love, they make some babies, well, just like any other couples out there. Meanwhile, Anna and Vronsky find themselves very isolated in Italy, and they are fed up with pizza and amaretto. No friends to socialize with, and they start to get tired of each other. Their love or lust alone doesn't make them happy. Human, huh? Nothing makes humans happy. Could. Vronsky, meanwhile, in spite of the complete realization of what he had so long desired, was not perfectly happy. He soon felt that the realization of his desires gave him no more than a grain of sand out of the mountain of happiness he had expected. It showed him the mistake men make in picturing to themselves happiness as the realization of their desires. Ciao Italia and they return to Russia. St. Petersburg, here we come. But back on the Russian soil, things are very different. Anna is totally ostracized by everyone she knew, so she remains indoor, alone, and disgraced. Vronsky, however, is free to go around, meet and mingle with everyone. Damn double standard. I guess Vronsky was a single man, so nobody blames him. But Anna was a mother and a wife, so everyone blames her. Anna starts analyzing, overthinking, then gets paranoid with Vronsky's activities outside. Every time Vronsky comes home, she smells his clothes for any scent of some other woman. Kidding, but you get the point, she is going mad. She decides to visit her son, Sergei, on his ninth birthday in the middle of the night. This is one of the most moving scenes in the novel as the boy is half asleep, Karenin wakes up and sees Anna with the boy and she leaves. It's heartbreaking. Still, the man doesn't want to divorce her in the hope she might return to him. But Anna continues to fight tooth and nail to be with Vronsky despite all the hostilities. Anna's had enough of sitting alone at home, so she decides not to give a shit about what people think, so she goes to the theater. But she is so insulted by her own friends that she and Vronsky decide to leave St. Petersburg for a second time. This time they head to the countryside for some peace. Here Tolstoy compares the two couples side by side. Levin and Kitty have a more modest and simple life. They still have their issues like jealousy and other things. Anna and Vronsky, however, have a more lavish lifestyle. Despite the flashy and glitzy facade, Anna's deeply unhappy and jealous when Vronsky is not around. Countryside gets boring too. They decide to move to Moscow. Things get from bad to worse for Anna. Now she has discovered drugs, morphine, to ease her pain of jealousy and paranoia. Love is the definition of irrationality and madness. She thinks Vronsky is having sex with multiple women. Moscow is no different from St. Petersburg. People judge you just the same. The scandal follows them wherever they go like some dark shadow. Anna and Vronsky have a big fight because Vronsky wants to go to his mother for a few days. Anna thinks it's all over for her. She decides to follow him. At the train station, just like the beginning of the novel, Tolstoy fires Chekhov's gun. Anna throws herself in front of a moving train to complete our Russian tragedy that started at train station, continued into the bedroom, and ended in the train station. Here's a quote. And the light by which she had read books filled with troubles, falsehood, sorrow, and evil flared up more brightly than ever before lighted up for her all that had been in darkness, flickered, began to grow dim, and was quenched forever. With Anna's death, the novel doesn't stop. She wasn't the only protagonist in the novel. Tolstoy didn't center his novels on an individual protagonist or hero, but several of them, because he believed in the power of society in groups, not individuals. Just in War and Peace, when a man's not happy, he goes to war. Vronsky joins the army to defend fellow Slavs in Bulgaria against the Turks, hoping to die in the war. Anna's husband, Karenin, takes the custody of both kids. Our other couple, Levin and Kitty, continue to have their struggles, have babies, fight and make love. Levin becomes religious in an attempt to discover himself and be a better person, only to realize that nothing can make him a perfect person. He accepts life's imperfection. Quote, when Levin thought what he was and what he was living for, he could find no answer to the question and would reduce to despair. So he decides to just live without really analyzing it too much. That is it. Life is meant to be lived, not analyzed too much. Life goes on. 
family. After reading War and Peace, you notice Anna Karenina is a much simpler novel in its language, plot, and ambition. Tolstoy is more relaxed as he has no ambition to challenge history or Napoleon. Instead, he tackles marriage, the oldest institution in human history. For millennia, family has stood the test of time. But with the arrival of modernity, we have individual freedom, and now we find couples initially in love, but find each other unbearable as time goes on. Tolstoy highlights St. Petersburg as the most modern city of bureaucrats, where Anna and Karenin, the coldest couple, live. Dolly and Steve are a bit warm in Moscow, where aristocrats live. And Levin and Kitty in the country are the warmest couple in the novel where landed gentry live. So the more modern you are, the less warmth there is between couples. Karenin represents the new bureaucratic class, maintaining the machinery of the state. They are efficient, boring, and reliable. Aristocrats, on the other hand, are old-fashioned, judgmental, and deeply ingrained in their own ways. Karenin is deeply open-minded and is willing to accept Anna despite her affairs. This is totally unacceptable among the aristocrats. Also, St. Petersburg, being farther north, is literally cold and metaphorically cold, while Moscow still has that Russian warmth. For Tolstoy, family is the best way to live, have kids and be productive in society. It gives men their role to provide for their family and give women their role to nurture their kids. But with modern individualism, people don't know how to reconcile individual freedom with familial and social duties. Anna fails in her duty as a mother and wife, but fulfills her individual goal of pursuing happiness, but ends tragically. She is goal-oriented and driven. Karenin and Levin, on the other hand, sticks to their duty as husband, father, and good citizen. Levin is more likable because he struggles to be good and ultimately sticks to his gender role. Tolstoy shows that women's transgressions are less tolerated in society, especially in high society who are supposed to keep traditions and norms. Anna is severely punished, while Vronsky is not. You might say because she was a woman, but you could also say Anna was a wife and a mother. Vronsky was a single man. Vronsky's transgression didn't hurt anyone, but Anna's did. It hurt her husband and their child. Society controls our carnal desires, like parents put rules on their kids. I guess Tolstoy tells us that you should drive your happiness from your duty as a good partner, parent, or citizen. Happiness Tolstoy says happiness is nothing but illusion, a mirage. The grass wasn't green on the other side. We think freedom from family and society makes us happy, but society tries to tame us. Tolstoy, by not telling us about Anna's unhappiness before she meets Vronsky, tries to show that it's not a good choice to abandon your partner and child for your own hedonistic pleasures. Tolstoy uses Vronsky to test Anna. When she meets him, she realizes her dissatisfaction with her husband, her unhappiness, and how bored she is. You could say bad influence, like bad friends make you do bad things. But you could also say her encounter with a charming officer opens her eyes to another lifestyle. In fact, this makes us dislike Anna as a selfish, impulsive person who risks her marriage for some passion. Her husband takes his duties as a husband and father extremely seriously, but not Anna. She escapes her duties as a mother and wife. I guess Tolstoy tells us that marriage is not about happiness, it's about duty. Tolstoy warns Anna about destroying her family at the beginning of the novel. Tolstoy sends Anna to make peace between Steve and Dolly in their marriage because of the same issue, an affair. Anna ignores this. Rosemary Edmonds, the English translator, sums up the theme of the novel, quote, No one may build their happiness on another's pain. It's not your duty to make others happy, but it's certainly your duty not to make others unhappy. Levin, the other main character, is self-deprecating, humble, always assessing his life, comparing Western ideas with Russian values, and, and finally realizing that there is no perfection in this world, not in marriage, happiness, or life. Quote, If you look for perfection, you will never be satisfied. If you seek perfection in anything, you are bound to fail. Trains are new in Russia. From St. Petersburg to Moscow would have taken days, now takes hours. This messes up your psyche. You desire things faster. Anna is the victim of railway technology that speeded up time, literally as she died in front of the train. 
but also metaphorically as she becomes less and less patient with her unhappiness. So you could say that the third most important character in Anna and Karenina is the railway in Russia. Anna's marriage is like a boring station. Vronsky station, however, is full of adventures, happier, greener, and more lush. We all switch jobs, partners, even jump over borders to other countries in pursuit of something better. So Tolstoy, like many people at the time, saw trains the enemy of simple happiness. Today we might say the internet has done the same thing. We want instant gratification. The parallel is here. Today social media has speeded up things even more. As soon as Anna started comparing Vronsky to her husband, she lost the battle. After other people, you are your worst enemy. Your worst enemy of good result is your conscious pursuit. Tolstoy believed in human intuition, a kind of mystical power that is better than your rational mind. We saw in War and Peace, General Kutuzov believed in the spirit of the army, like a mystical power that no battle tactic or modern thinking could replace. In Anna Karenina, we see Levin applies the same thing in farming. Here's a quote. Another row and yet another row followed long rows and short rows with good grass with poor grass. Levin lost all sense of time and he could not have told whether it was late or early now. A change began to come over his work which gave him immense satisfaction. In the midst of his toil there were moments during which he forgot what he was doing and it came all easy to him. But as soon as he recollected what he was doing and began trying to do better, he was at once conscious of all the difficulty of his task, and the row was badly mown. When you're absorbed, time flies. When you consciously see happiness, it moves further away from you. Modernity gives us the false premise of putting our happiness and fulfillment as our conscious goal. Instead, we should derive our fulfillment from what we do, in other words, from our duties towards others, be it your partner, customer, viewer, child, friends, or family. So Anna, one man's wife, another man's lover, yet another man's sister, and one's mother, wanted to be free. Tolstoy tells us we are never free from society. Society is our doom and salvation, our source of misery and intense happiness. It all depends how you navigate the spider web of social fabrics. Tolstoy says history books are like works of fiction. Great men of history like Napoleon are more like fictional heroes, created, shaped and glorified by historians. What is the main premise of Tolstoy's masterpiece, War and Peace? What is it about? What is the plot? Why is it important and why is it considered the greatest novel of all time? In this video, I'll tell you everything about this masterpiece. Vaina Emir or War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy published in 1869 is often called the greatest novel of all time. Everyone has heard of it but few have read it and even fewer have finished it. Tolstoy himself, however, didn't consider it a novel. Why? Because it's three books in one by combining history, philosophy, and fiction. So in this video, I'll discuss all three topics. First, I'll give you a brief historical context and Tolstoy's motivation in writing such a massive novel. Second, I'll summarize the main plot in two parts. Third, I'll discuss Tolstoy's philosophical approach to history. And finally, I'll leave you with a few points of analysis and an interesting quote at the end. So get your coffee and sit back and let me take you back to Russia in 1812 as Napoleon's French army of 400,000 strong were marching towards Moscow. After watching this video, you will know pretty much everything you need to know about Tolstoy's masterpiece, a beast of a novel of 1200 pages long with almost 600 characters full of philosophical digressions and war strategies. Okay, before I summarize the novel, let me give you a little historical context. Catherine the Great, who ruled Russia from 1762 to 1796, made French her official court language. So most of the Russian nobility spoke French. Here is the irony though. Napoleon didn't have to invade Russia, because those who ruled Russia were all French-speaking people. The Russian aristocrats loved French culture and they even read French literature. In fact, you could say Napoleon's invasion of Russia hindered French culture from flourishing in Russia. Instead, it cemented Russian culture and nationalism even more. Tolstoy's main character in War and Peace is a Francophile with a French name Pierre, a Russian educated in France. So Tolstoy was making a point here. 
In the 1860s, when Tolstoy was in his mid-30s, while visiting Paris, he met Victor Hugo, who had just published his masterpiece, La Miserable, often called the greatest French novel of all time. So upon returning to Russia, Tolstoy and newlywed and aching to write something big and spectacular. He settled himself behind a desk at his large country state of Yasnaya Polyana to write a huge novel as ambitious as Victor Hugo's Le Rob or Balzac's Human Comedies or Stendhal's Crystallization or How Things Happen. Tolstoy wanted to understand Russia, especially what led to the emancipation of Serbs in 1861 when 31 million Russians were suddenly free. Tolstoy knew this event had its root in 1820s, especially the Decemberist Revolt of 1825, when the Russian aristocrats revolted against the Tsar, but failed. Tolstoy then thought to understand 1820s, he had to look what had happened before the 1812 Russian victory over Napoleon. And to understand that, he had to go back again to 1805, when Napoleon decisively defeated the Russians and Austrians at the Battle of Austerlitz in 1805. So war and peace begins in 1805 and ends in 1820s. So Tolstoy was inspired by French literature, set himself the task of writing about the French-Russian wars. When Tolstoy started to write about the Napoleonic Wars, he quickly realized there were plenty of records about the military and political leadership or people of power, but not much about the peasants or soldiers who actually fought in the wars. Here came Tolstoy's realization that historians tend to fictionalize history by focusing on few major characters while forgetting the people who do the fighting. Why? For the same reason novelists tend to create as few characters as possible for the sake of simplicity. So Tolstoy formed his own theory of history. The official history books are fictionalized version of history, so they solely focus on the kings and generals, in other words, fictional heroes. Tolstoy believed these so-called historical heroes, such as Napoleon, couldn't have changed the course of history by themselves but it was the entire society, from those fighting in the trenches, to the peasants producing the food, to the farmers feeding the horses, and to the women who looked after the children, they all contributed to historical events. But historians hardly ever mention the millions of soldiers or ordinary men and women. Here's a quote. The movement of nation is caused not by power, nor by intellectual activity, nor even by combination of the two as historians have supposed, but by the activity of all the people who participate in the events, and who always combine in such a way that those taking the largest direct share in the event take on themselves the least responsibility, and vice versa. To illustrate this, let me give you an example. The reason most politicians break their promises is very simple. They are unable to implement change. So it's ridiculous to say history happened because of these men at the top. Tolstoy says when looking at a steam locomotive, historians tend to focus on the smoke and ignore the rest. For example, Will Drawn's history books are titled after an individual for the sake of simplicity and clarity. By focusing on these leaders, historians give them a kind of superhero power. History for Tolstoy is about an entire people, not just individual heroes who are pedestalized by historians. Here's a quote. There are two sides to the life of every man, his individual life, which is the more free, the more abstract its interests, and his elemental hive life, in which he inevitably obeys laws laid down for him. Man lives consciously for himself, but is an unconscious instrument in the attainment of the historic universal aims of humanity. A deed done is irrevocable and its result coinciding in time with the actions of millions of other men assumes a historic significance. The higher a man stands on the social ladder, the more people he is connected with. And the more power he has over others, the more evident is the predestination and inevitability of his free action. Tolstoy was a huge admirer of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the French philosopher who believed that humans on the innate level are good, but society corrupts them. And he famously said that humans are born free, but everywhere in chains. But he also used the Hegelian notion that we are the product of our time. A queen bee is not determining the course of a hive, but slave to its rules, just as soldier bees are. Quote, 
History, that is, the unconscious, general, hive life of mankind, uses every moment of the life of kings as a tool for its own purposes. So Tolstoy set himself to write a fictionalized history that focused on those people who are mostly ignored by historians. This is Tolstoy's Copernican Revolution. He uses fiction to tell the true history of the Napoleonic Wars, which is ironic. He combines the military, social, emotional, and existential history of that period. So Tolstoy's War and Peace is a novel, a history book, and also a meditation on life. There is a saying that history is written by the victors, but literature is written about the outsiders, those who are ignored by history books. To make his point crystal clear, Tolstoy treats all his characters as real people with flaws and redeeming qualities who make mistakes, forget things, often contradict themselves. So you really see them as genuinely real people. But the one character the guy historians spend most time talking about is depicted by Tolstoy as almost cartoonishly square is Mr. Napoleon. Just to poke fun at history books. Or perhaps Tolstoy looked down on Napoleon for invading his country, or because he was a short man. Tolstoy himself was a tall and huge man. Even his name Tolstoy in Russian means thick or fat. But I have to be fair, Tolstoy shows no prejudice towards the French, so in that sense he is a truly universalist. So Napoleon, the superhero of history books, is caricatured in War and Peace, while other characters who don't make it into history books are depicted as real humans by Tolstoy. Ok, now I'll summarize Tolstoy's War and Peace. This summary is delivered in two parts. Each part covers about half of the novel. Summary Part 1 The historical background of War and Peace is the Napoleonic Wars of 1805 and 1812. But the main story is about five Russian noble families in the span of some 15 years, before and after Napoleon's invasion of Russia in 1812. The families are the Bezukhovs, the Bolkonskis, the Rostovs, the Kuragins, and the Drubitsukhoys. Ok, who is the protagonist of War and Peace? Tolstoy's entire philosophy was built on the importance of groups, not individual heroes. But I will go against Tolstoy here due to time constraint and tell you that out of 600 characters, three are pretty important characters in the novel. Napoleon is not one of them. The first main character is Count Pierre Bezukhov, a France-educated Russian, hence the name Pierre, but he's slightly awkward Russian who mostly resembles and represents Tolstoy himself and his way of thinking. So if you have to pick a protagonist in War and Peace, it's Pierre. The second character that is pretty important in the novel is Natasha Rostova, who we meet in 1805 when she's 13 years old and later on as a grown woman. She represents the passionate and spontaneous Russian woman full of life and energy. The third important character is Prince Andrei Bolkonsky, who is perhaps the most Russian of all male characters. He is a somewhat nihilistic intellectual who represents Russian pessimism, as well as the courage of not being afraid of death. He's perhaps the character Tolstoy wanted to be himself. Despite being a very rational person, he possesses that Russian value of bravery. Prince Andrei represents the rational side of Tolstoy, while Pierre represents the irrational, often indecisive and impressionable side, who lacks clarity of thought, and floats about until he finds an anchor among the Freemasons and also Natasha. So Prince Andrei is the Apollo, the man of reason, and Pierre is the Dionysian, man of impulsive emotion. Pierre as a character is outsider because he is an illegitimate son and also awkward, so it's apt to say that while history books are about victors, fiction however is about outsiders. Pierre doesn't feel at home in Russia because he's educated in France and loves Napoleon like a hero. Of course, later on he is transformed by Tolstoy. Ok, we are in 1805 in St. Petersburg at a soiree, a social gathering of the Russian high society including princes and princesses, counts and all sorts where we meet two of the main characters. Pierre, whose wealthy father, Count Bezukhov, is on the verge of death and is about to inherit a good chunk of money, so he finds himself quite popular among everyone. He's in St. Petersburg to find a job, but his foreign education and awkward personality make it difficult to find a job. He listens to other people talk all kinds of shit, but he just listens. His best friend, Prince Andrei Bolkonsky, who is recently married, complains about his wife and is fed up with life in St. Petersburg. Here Tolstoy draws on his own life, being married but not satisfied with life. 
Incidentally, despite loving his wife, Tolstoy had a very unhappy marriage. Back then, marriage was seen as an eternal road to happiness. But of course, we know that idealized expectation leaves you disappointed and sometimes in existential crisis. So, Prince Andre, not happy at home, decided to join the army alongside Prince Mikhail Kutuzov, the main Russian general who defeated Napoleon in 1912. So far, we talked about people from two families, the Bezukhovs, represented by Pierre, and the Balkonskis by Andre. Now, the action moves to Moscow, the former capital of Russia. St. Petersburg represents the new European Russia, a bit colder being further north, and also being a bit more westernized and formal, therefore slightly fake and full of hypocrisy. Moscow, however, still has the charm of the old Russia, full of warmth and friendliness. In Moscow, we meet our third family in War and Peace, the Rostovs, mainly Count Ilya and his wife Natalia, and their four kids, one of which is our main female protagonist. Their 13-year-old daughter Natasha, a very spontaneous and vivacious girl who is in love with Boris, a boy from another family called the Drubetskoys, our fourth family in the novel. Boris is about to join the Russian army to fight Napoleon. The teenage Natasha remains one of the most important characters in the novel. She represents a kind of Russian woman who is full of energy and passion, who dances like crazy, but she doesn't care. In fact, she falls in love with several men throughout the novel, namely the two main male characters, Pierre and Prince Andre. Later on, she becomes a very caring wife and mother. Some criticize Tolstoy for taming her wild character, but life and aging tame you, no matter how wild you are. Tolstoy writing always remains true to life. While we are in Moscow, the war is happening somewhere in the distance. You can't hear the gunshots yet, but it's happening in the Western Front. It's important to note that all these families know one another and have some sort of connections. The aristocrats in every country would stick with their own kind, so it's a small world, so to speak. Prince Andrei, the most pessimistic and most Russian character, tired of his marriage, leaves his pregnant wife alone to join the war against the French. Little did he know that his wife would die at childbirth and he himself would get wounded in the war. The action moves to the battleground, the 1905 Battle of Austerlitz, in which Napoleon inflicted a heavy defeat on the Russians and Austrians. Here we see Napoleon for the first time through Prince Andrei, when he is wounded and captured by the French army. Andre, like all young men of that period, was fascinated by the character of Napoleon, just like the superhero of today. Here Tolstoy makes it clear how fictionalized Napoleon had become. While lying down on the ground, Napoleon happens to pass by. Here's a quote. So insignificant at that moment seemed to me all the interest that engrossed Napoleon. So mean did his hero himself with his paltry vanity and joy and victory appear compared to the lofty, equitable, and kindly sky which he had seen and understood. This is a reminder of Marcel Proust's novel In Search of Lost Time, when Marcel goes to Venice, the build-up and expectation are crushed when he sees Venice itself. Here Tolstoy tells us the historical figures are not as big or heroic as our imaginations make them. So in essence, history is a work of fiction because Napoleon is made bigger because we are led to believe he was greater than he was. Tolstoy says, Looking into Napoleon's eyes, Prince Andre thought this insignificance of greatness, the unimportance of life which no one could understand, and the still greater unimportance of death, the meaning of which no one alive could understand or explain. Summary Part 2 Okay, our first main historical battle is over, with the French having a decisive victory against the Russians and Austrians. Now the second and most important battle is coming up. But right now, enough wars, we move to Moscow again with Nikolai Rostov, Natasha's father. Here, Tolstoy tells us about some romances blossoming among the youth of Russian aristocrats. Men propose and women reject. Parents want to marry their kids to richer kids for practical reasons. But you know kids, they, they're stupid to fall in love with their hearts, not head. So the topic of love, marriage, money fly around a lot. Speaking of money, our awkward main character, Count Pierre, has finally won the lottery. He has received a huge amount of money in inheritance. Now everyone wants to be friends with him and all the ladies want to marry him. He is the biggest prize in Moscow. But for Napoleon, of course, and the French army, however, Moscow itself is the real prize. But more on that later. With lots of money, Pierre has gained self-confidence and charm. 
He finally marries Elaine or Elena Krogina, who comes from our fifth family in War and Peace, the Krogins. She's very beautiful, but a bit sexually liberated and often promiscuous. It's clear that she's after Pierre's money and doesn't love him. There's also a rumor that she may have had incestuous relationship with her own brother, Anatole Krogin, a drunkard womanizer. Also possibly had an affair with another man called Fyodor Ivanovich Dolokhov, a psychopathic gambler. We are in Russia, so you know what happens. There is a duel, of course. Pierre against Dolokhov. Pierre injures Dolokhov in the duel. This experience transforms Pierre into a philosopher. In all Russian novels, duels are the most transformative event in the character's life. You either die, get injured, or your whole outlook on life changes. Pierre is no longer interested in his wife, Elaine, but instead he's seeking to find the meaning of life and how to be a good man. So what does he do? He joins the Freemasons and become a pacifist. Tolstoy himself was a pacifist and even said to have influenced Mahatma Gandhi, the biggest pacifist in the 20th century. Around the same time, his friend Prince Andrei returns from the war physically wounded, but now also psychologically wounded because his abandoned wife died at childbirth, for which he blames himself, and as a result has become even more nihilistic and pessimistic about life. Also important to note that his superhero, Mr. Napoleon, was nothing but a disappointing character. Now the two troubled men, Andre and Pierre, need some comfort. I mean, womanly comfort. Elaine finally persuades Pierre to take her back. Prince Andre, now a widower, falls in love with a lively Natasha Rostov. When love arrives, nihilism goes out of the window. This same thing happened in Turgenev's father and sons. But Andre's father tells him that the Rostovs are not nice people. Also important to note that the Rostovs, despite their pomp, are a bit penniless. Andre's father tells him if he wants to marry her, he should wait for a year to see if he still loves her. Andre, being a sensible man, thinks this is a good advice, so he tells Natasha that he needs time. But he also tells Natasha that she's free to not wait for him. And that's what she does. While Andre is waiting, the energetic young Natasha has a few romantic adventures here and there, and even considers an elopement with Anatole Krogin, a hedonistic man who loves women and wine, who is supposedly have had sex with her sister, Elaine, Pierre's wife. There are more rejections and scheming going on among the Russian nobility. Even Pierre, our philosopher, falls in love with Natasha. Her energy is infectious. When Andre finds out about Natasha's transgressions, he's deeply hurt. But being a rationally mature man, he nurses his wounds quietly like an injured animal, so he doesn't make a scene about it. He heads to the battlefront. Men fight wars for two reasons, in the hope of getting a woman, when victorious, or escape a heartbreak. Andre's heartbreak makes him even more determined to go to war. I talked about this in my video on George Orwell, that conflicts give us profound purpose in life. When you feel empty inside, you immediately look for some conflicts on the outside. Andre is heartbroken by Natasha's youthful mistakes, so he heads to the battle. Pierre, however, lives a peaceful life, thus feels very empty. We humans need a battle, a struggle, or a conflict to keep us going or give us a purpose. Even joining the Freemasons didn't help Pierre much. So what does he do? He falls in love with Natasha, a woman who broke his best friend's heart. Ah, we humans always need some drama and chaos in our lives, don't we? In Tolstoy's novel, falling in love is like going to war. Even marriage, supposed to be peaceful, blissful, smooth sailing, is in fact conflict, contradictions, and often chaos. While the Russian high society is absorbed in their own romantic battles, Napoleon wants the whole Moscow, the whole Russia. The war is nearing. Pierre, our philosopher, connects a few dots about Napoleon being the Antichrist. So he decides it's time he helped his country, Mother Russia. We enter the Battle of Borodino, the most decisive battle in war and peace, as well as history books. The violence is terrible, dead bodies everywhere. Tolstoy, in fact, used his own personal experience of fighting in the Crimean War of 1850s as an artilleryman and frontline soldier. So the scenes are extremely vivid and real. Even Pierre's best friend, the nihilistic Prince Andrei, is also among the casualties. His sacrifice symbolized the courage and bravery of the Russian soldiers in defending their country. But also, on a personal level, he manages to forgive Anatole Krogin for going behind his back and trying to elope with Natasha. 
This is a very moving scene as Andre again shows he is the bigger man in War and Peace, even bigger than Napoleon because he forgives his enemy. It's important to note that Andre is wounded, but he dies later in the care of his lover, Natasha, whose betrayal he forgives, but then just like his early nihilistic tendencies, he loses his will to live. Quote, but at that instant he died, Prince Andre remembered that he was asleep. At that very instant he died, having made an effort, he awoke. Yes, it was death, I died, I woke up. Yes, death is awakening. Here Tolstoy says that life is a dream and death is like waking up from that dream, which is really beautiful and heartbreaking at the same time. The Russian army finally has halted the French advance, but decides on a tactical retreat to allow the French march on Moscow. Napoleon's French army with their allies, mainly the Poles, was the most sophisticated army at the time. The Russian army, however, was a kind of ramshackle group of peasants. The difference was, one was fighting for a genuine cause, defending their country. In fact, General Kutuzov often relied on instinct and intuition. At one point, when getting ready for the battle, his men ask him how to prepare, he tells them to have a good night's sleep. Kutuzov's approach is to go with the flow like wind, so almost mystical. Napoleon represents modernity, acting like a machine, while Kutuzov represents the flow of nature. Here's a quote. By long years of military experience, he knew and with the wisdom of age understood that it's impossible for one man to direct hundreds of thousands of others struggling with death and he knew that the result of a battle is decided not by the orders of the commander-in-chief, nor the place where the troops are stationed, nor by the number of cannon or of slaughtered men, but by that intangible force called the spirit of the army. And he watched this force and guided it in as far as that was in his power. Before abandoning the city, the Russians decided to burn Moscow. If we can't have it, we don't want the French to have it either. Napoleon finally enters Moscow, a city turned to ashes. Most people have left, but Pierre has remained behind. He has a slightly crazy plan. His plan is to stab evil in the eye. I mean, he wants to assassinate Napoleon himself. But he gets distracted from his big mission. In trying to be a hero to save an Armenian girl from robbers, he is captured by the French and his assassination plot is foiled. The French almost execute him, but he is spared at the last minute. While in captivity, he makes friends with a Russian peasant, Platon Karataev, who symbolizes the Russian honesty, integrity, and simplicity. For Tolstoy, innocence is better than intelligence. Peasants are connected with land, so close to nature, therefore they have that raw honesty and integrity, which the Russian nobility had lost. This reminded me of Dostoevsky's transformation while in prison in Siberia, when he came in contact with the Odin Russians whom he almost falls in love with and spends the rest of his life defending them. Here Tolstoy unites the Russian peasants with the aristocrats. Tolstoy paints an ironic picture here. Pierre in prison finds a kind of spiritual freedom that he lacked on the outside. The burning of Moscow was perhaps a tactical genius because the French couldn't survive the harsh winter in a city of ash so they had no choice but to retreat. When your back is against your enemy, you are most vulnerable. The Russians found the opportunity to attack them, depleting their army. Napoleon returns to France with his tail between his legs, humiliated, but most importantly lost 400,000 men. For what? Nothing. While in the hands of the French army as they retreat from Moscow, Pierre witnesses the terrible tragedies of war, and even his best friend, Platon, is shot dead by the French. Pierre himself, however, is lucky and rescued by Russian soldiers. He returns home to find that his wife has died of drug overdose. His best friend, Prince Andrei, is also dead, now a widower and friendless. What does he do? He finds love. He rekindles his romantic feelings with Natasha, and they get married. There are two epilogues in War and Peace, one talking about the characters, and the other explaining Tolstoy's philosophy behind the novel. Most readers find the second epilogue very annoying, anticlimactic. I think Tolstoy wanted to preemptively respond to his critics by giving a detailed response to how he interpreted history. Philosophical context. Okay, now it's a good time to talk about Tolstoy's philosophical expression for war and peace. In other words, how he understood the world and how we can understand history in the first place. Tolstoy was influenced by Arthur Schopenhauer's Will and Representation. 
To understand this, let's briefly look at the two major secular philosophical schools in Europe, the rationalists and the empiricists. The rationalists believe that we understand the world through reason. The best example is René Descartes, who sat in his armchair and rationalized. I think, therefore I am. So rationalists rely on ideas and thoughts to know what's going on. The empiricists, however, rely less on rational ideas but more on empirical data, i.e. our experience in the real world to understand the world. The empiricists were mostly English and Scottish philosophers like Thomas Hobbes and David Hume. So the rationalists say reason alone is enough to know the world, but the empiricists think experience let us know the world. So and how knowledge travels, rationalist is an inside-out approach, while empiricism is an outside-in approach. Then the German philosopher Immanuel Kant tried to bring these two schools, the rationalists and the empiricists, together by arguing that we humans, by rationally categorizing the world, we impose our own structure on the world. So we are not passive observers of reality, but actively making reality conform to our categorizations. So according to Kant, the human mind actively uses experience as a kind of tool to probe, categorize, and understand the world. Kant also made a distinction between two realms, phenomena, reality as they appear to us, and noumena, or reality as it is. Arthur Schopenhauer adopted Kantian philosophy in his book Will and Representation, which is relevant to us here as this book influenced Tolstoy and his own philosophy developed in War and Peace. Schopenhauer argued that the world that appeared to us, i.e. reality or history, is not the world that actually exists independent of us. According to Schopenhauer, human will is like a lens through which we see and interpret and even study the world, which is a mere representation of the actual world. Schopenhauer also said that human will is the source of human misery, which is similar to the Buddhist philosophy that desire makes us suffer more. So to bring it full circle, Tolstoy argues that historical events are not the result of individual leaders' will or whim, but rather bigger social forces or the will of the entire society that take a country to war, not its leaders. Hitler couldn't have mobilized Germany if the socio-economic conditions weren't right. Napoleon, according to Tolstoy, was somewhat like a puppet, an accidental leader pushed forward to lead the French. If he were to come at a different period in history, he would not have been able to mobilize a small village, let alone the entire French nation. Tolstoy subscribed to Hegel's idea that we are a product of our own period. For Tolstoy, leaders are like great men pushed to the front. Historical events happen because of thousands of smaller events that lead up to that big event, i.e. great wars. This same rule applies to the decision of an individual, for example, who to marry, what career to pick, even what to eat. There are thousands of conscious and subconscious triggers that lead up to you making a decision. Necessity, i.e. survival, forces us to act, but sometimes we also act because we want to thrive and dominate. Wars are often like wildfire, sometimes spontaneous and sometimes caused by arson. History is the same. Society is made up of millions of individuals. Each individual is made up of millions of cells. The unconscious universal swarm of life of humanity is often the blind force behind historical events. Tolstoy finally settles that free will does not exist. We all have to obey the strict rules of the hive we live in. Here's a quote. Speaking of the interaction of heat and electricity and of atoms, we cannot say why this occurs, and we say that it is because it's inconceivable otherwise, because it must be so and that is a law. The same applies to historical events. Why war and revolution occur, we do not know. We only know that to produce the one or the other action, people combine in certain formation in which they all take part. And we say that this is because it is unthinkable otherwise. Or in other words, that is a law. So for Tolstoy, free will is more like an illusion. He says, the great natural forces lie outside us and we are not conscious of them. We call those forces gravitation, inertia, electricity, animal force and so on but we are conscious of the force of life in man. We call that freedom. Now, I'll discuss a few interesting points in War and Peace. 
Tolstoy paints his characters as real people with genuine emotions, flaws, inconsistencies, and should be copied by all novelists. Every human being has flaws and good qualities. Simon Shoma, the British historian, sums up very well. Tolstoy didn't write characters, he wrote people. That is so true. You get to know his characters so well. History is a lot more random than historians tend to make. Historians tend to explain history in a way that things happen for a reason or a rational explanation. But Tolstoy thinks history is packed with emotional outbursts, spontaneous events, just like real person lives their life full of spontaneous action. History is a lot more random than historians tend to make. Life is a struggle. War and peace cannot exist without the other. In every aspect of life there is a battle going on. Even falling in love and getting married is like going to war. Family life is full of battles, so Tolstoy juxtaposes war with family life. Family loyalty is like nationalism, being loyal to a country and society. Society nourishes us but also corrupts us. Humans are the same in every country. You just need to peel a layer to recognize that we're all the same. Tolstoy contrasts social warmth, friendship, family, and camaraderie among soldiers with the cold of unhappy family, enemies, and violence. So society is the cause of our happiest experience in life and also unhappiest experiences. Tolstoy points out that those at the top, aristocrats, have a fake kind of honor and courage, while the common soldiers and peasants have real courage and make real sacrifices. War and peace is a great mirror of society, how people decide their priorities and cope with their mistakes and how they amend those mistakes. The Russian title of war and peace could also mean war in the world. Vaina means war, Mir in Russian means both peace and the world. So the name Vladimir literally means a boy who rules the world. So Tolstoy's novel is really about how society functions. Of course today, War and Peace is used to torture Russian kids in schools, as it is a compulsory read as far as I know. Be happy that you don't live in Russia. Tolstoy was interested in Europe and he characterized each nation thus, which is pretty funny I thought. Here we go. Only Germans are self-confident on the basis of an abstract notion, science, that is, the supposed knowledge of absolute truth. A Frenchman is self-assured because he regards himself personally, both in mind and body, as irresistibly attractive to men and women. An Englishman is self-assured as being a citizen of the best organized state in the world. And therefore, as an Englishman always knows what he should do and knows that all he does as an Englishman is undoubtedly correct. An Italian is self-assured because he's excitable and easily forgets himself and other people. A Russian is self-assured just because he knows nothing and does not want to know anything since he does not believe that anything can be known. The German self-assurance is worst of all, stronger and more repulsive than any other because he imagines that he knows the truth, science, which he himself has invented, but which is for him the absolute truth. When you read Tolstoy, the first thing you notice is that you believe he's telling the truth. His characters are real people. The dialogue sounds convincing. Something else too, Tolstoy didn't write for money. He was well off and he didn't have to write to make ends meet. He wrote because he couldn't do otherwise. In other words, he was a genuine artist who was open-minded enough to observe, understand and write about his time. Not only that, he knew how literature worked. Quote, all great literature is one of two stories, a man goes on a journey or a stranger comes to town. In other words, literature tells the stories of disruption to the status quo. All Tolstoy's novels are about disruption, wars, affairs, illnesses, revelations and death. Tip number one, honesty. Everyone can write, but few novelists can be as brutally honest as Tolstoy. Dostoevsky was another one. In fact, what makes Russian literature so popular around the world is that brutal Russian honesty. No sugar coating or averting your gaze from the ugly. We all take different personas in our lives to the point of self-deception. Tolstoy peeled many layers to write what really saw and felt. Quote, 
tell the truth is a very difficult thing and young people are rarely capable of it. Honesty gives your writing more depth and makes it live much longer because the deeper you dig into your soul, the more you get to the truth about human condition. Therefore, anyone can relate to you. Quote, one ought only to write when one leaves a piece of one's own flesh in the ink pot, each time one dips one's pen. In other words, Tolstoy characters are all slice of his own self. Tip number two, body language. We all lie and so do Tolstoy's characters. But our body language speaks more honestly than words. I don't know who, but someone described Tolstoy as a poet of human body and Dostoevsky a poet of the human soul. Tolstoy's precise description of his characters plants the reader right in front of them. You hear their words, then watch their body language. Thus, you see through them as if they are real people. When Tolstoy writes dialogue, he does something else too. He shows us their body language, gestures and facial expressions. Now you have a full view to observe them. Now you know them. So Tolstoy pairs every dialogue with some action. What characters do, like smoke, drink, gesture. And as reader, you observe them while listening to their words. That is Tolstoy's gift. Quote, Live the lives of the people described. Describe in images their inner feelings and the characters themselves will do what they must do according to their natures. There's also something else. Tolstoy was also a poet of silence. Silence can be louder than words. Once you master the gap between words, body language and silence, your characters come to life. According to Simon Sharma, the British historian, Tolstoy didn't write characters, he wrote people. Tip number three. People would consider Tolstoy a novelist of human drama. It is true. He wrote about human relationships. The reason for that is that we are social creatures. Even novels of loneliness are about relationships or lack of it. Our deepest happiness and sadness are often experienced in the presence of others. Human relationships are an endless source of beauty, comfort, and sadness, and ugliness. I think the most successful novelists are those who can write human relationships well. And Tolstoy is one of them. We individuals are entangled in groups, our family, society, country, and the world. And how we navigate our relationship with our family, friends, and colleagues, compatriots, has puzzled humans from the beginning of time and will likely continue in the future. So read Tolstoy and write about human relationships. Tip number four, get inspired. When Tolstoy met Victor Hugo in Paris in 1860s, who had published his masterpiece Le Miserable, he was so inspired to do the same thing. He returned to Russia and sat down to write a really massive novel. The result is War and Peace. Ten years later, he wrote Anna Karenina, again perhaps in response to Gustave Flaubert's Madame Bovary. Of course, it would be naive to suggest that Tolstoy only wrote his novels to prove a point. Be inspired to write, but not for the wrong reason. Quote, the main thing is not to be in a hurry to write, not to grudge correcting and revising the same thing 10 or 20 times. Not to write a lot and not, for heaven's sake, to make of writing a means of livelihood or of winning importance in people's eyes. Use other authors to motivate yourself or add to the fuel that is already in your tank. Tolstoy also warns you, quote, You should only write when you feel within you some completely new and important content, clear to you but unintelligible to others and when the need to express this content gives you no peace. Tip number five, write more, think less. In Anna Karenina, Levin, while cutting the grass, is so absorbed in the action that he loses the sense of time. But there's a crucial point. While not aware of his action, he's doing a better job. As soon as he starts thinking how to do a better job, he loses it. In other words, being aware is the enemy of artistic ability. When writers lose the sense of time and place, they enter a new realm where their characters are real people and that's when you achieve that artistic flow. Of course, this comes with practice. The more you write, the easier it is to be in the flow. 
Tolstoy was famous for writing endless pages in his first draft. Quote, Don't spare your labor, write as it comes at length and then revise it, and above all shorten it. In the business of writing, gold is only obtained, in my experience, by sifting. To achieve your writer's flow, enter the subconscious by writing more and thinking less. So these are the writing tips from Leo Tolstoy. Let me know what you think. I'll leave you with this quote. The epitaph that I would write for history would say, I conceal nothing. It's not enough not to lie. One should strive not to lie in the negative sense by remaining silent. Tolstoy wrote because he couldn't remain silent. Here's a fact. Dostoevsky and Tolstoy lived around the same time, often in the same city, St. Petersburg, but they never met. Dostoevsky was eager to meet, but Tolstoy apparently showed no interest. It's pure speculation, but I think Tolstoy being a count saw Dostoevsky just as a regular dude. Both authors, however, were friends with Turgenev. Also, another reason is that Tolstoy disliked Dostoevsky's most famous novel, Crime and Punishment, because he wasn't convinced that a poor young man would be willing to murder people to get rich or change the world. Dostoevsky, however, was full of admiration for Tolstoy's great novel, Anna Karenina. Here is Dostoevsky. Anna Karenina is sheer perfection as work of art. No European work of fiction of our present day comes anywhere near it. Furthermore, the idea underlying it shows that it is ours. Ours! Something that belongs to us alone. And that's our property. Our own national new word. Or at any rate, the beginning of it. After Dostoevsky's death in 1881, Tolstoy lamented. I have never seen this man and never had any relations with him, and all of a sudden when he died I understood that this was the closest, the dearest man for me, the man whose presence I needed the most. I considered him a friend and had no doubt that we will see each other someday. But unfortunately they never did. In this video I'll compare the two giants of Russian literature, Leo Tolstoy and Fyodor Dostoevsky. I'll tell you about their lives, novels, styles of writing, themes, characters, belief, and much more. At the end, I'll tell you which author is more popular today. I'll show you some stats as well and tell you which author I prefer and why. I have summarized and reviewed three of Dostoevsky's novels, Crime and Punishment, The Brothers Karamazov, and Notes from Underground, and two of Tolstoy's novels, War and Peace and Anna Karenina. Also, in separate videos, I have talked about 8 lessons from Tolstoy and 8 lessons from Dostoevsky, mainly about their life philosophies. I'll put a link in the description in case you want to watch them later. Russian context In the 18th century, under Catherine the Great, Russia expanded East Siberia and South Central Asia, adopted French language and culture. Then, Napoleon got excited thinking Russians would welcome him, but he got humiliated in 1812. Both Dostoevsky and Tolstoy grew up reading the two great Russian Romantic poets, Alexander Pushkin and Mikhail Lermontov, but also the satirical prose of Nikolai Gogol. They both witnessed one of the most important events in Russian history, taking place in 1861, when 31 million Russian serfs were emancipated. At the same time, there was a huge influx of Western influence like French art and literature, German and English capitalism, as well as philosophies of utilitarianism, rationalism and atheism. Russian intellectuals were divided between the Slavophiles who wanted to keep Russian values and traditions on the one hand, and westernized radicals who wanted to destroy the Russian way of life in order to build a modern, rational society on the other. This struggle culminated in 1917 communist revolution led by Vladimir Lenin. Life and Korea Dostoevsky was born in 1821 in Moscow. Unlike other writers of his period, he was a city boy, not a country gentleman. His father was a low-level doctor. Tolstoy was born seven years later in 1828 in their family country state Yasnaya Polyana and grew up in an aristocratic family. 
so their widely different socioeconomic situation influenced their worldview and writings. Dostoevsky's first novel, Poor Folk, about the plight of the Russian poor, published in 1845 when he was 24 years old. Dostoevsky's entire body of work focuses on those at the bottom of the Russian society. Tolstoy's first novel, Childhood, published six years later in 1852 when he was 23 years old, focused on his own life growing up in which he wrote about losing both parents at a very young age. Tolstoy's mother died when he was two and his father died when he was nine. As a result of growing up without parents, Tolstoy's entire body of work focuses on family. Tolstoy published two more novels in the series titled Boyhood and Youth, all autobiographical. Dostoevsky, however, had a very different fate after his first novel. In 1849, he was arrested, almost executed because of his radical activities, and sent to Siberia, where he spent almost 10 years in the harshest conditions. The result was a massive change in his views about Russia and the West. He depicted that experience in Siberia in his novel The House of the Dead in 1861. Tolstoy, however, had an easier time of it. He spent his time womanizing, drinking wine, and gambling like Prince Harry. He was expelled from Kazan University in Tataristan, where he was supposed to study Oriental languages. To experience the harsh reality of life, Tolstoy joined the army in the Battle of Crimea in 1854 and 55. This experience helped him to grow up a bit, but also helped give his writing depth, especially later on in War and Peace. After returning from exile, Dostoevsky wrote like crazy. First, he published Notes from Underground in 1864, considered the first existentialist novel. That same year, he lost both his wife and brother. Two years later, in 1866, he published his most famous novel, Crime and Punishment. Around the same time, Tolstoy got married to a very young woman, traveled to Europe and wrote three novels, Family Happiness in 1859, The Cossacks in 1863, and his most famous novel, War and Peace in 1869. Dostoevsky's last and longest novel, The Brothers Karamazov, which most people believe to be his greatest novel, was published in 1879, two years before his death in 1881. Tolstoy's own favorite novel, Anna Karenina, was published two years before The Brothers Karamazov in 1877. Tolstoy's last novel, Haji Murat, was published in 1912, two years after his own death in 1910. Dostoevsky wrote 16 novels and novellas, a career that lasted 36 years, with Brother Karamazov being the longest, with 350,000 words or about 1,000 pages in English translation. Crime and Punishment is about 210,000 words or 700 pages. Tolstoy wrote 14 novels and novellas, a career that lasted 42 years. Tolstoy's longest novel, War and Peace, is 587,000 words or 2,000 pages. His second longest novel is Anna Karenina with 350,000 words or 1,000 pages. Both were in Russian army for a period of time. Both traveled to Europe extensively. Dostoevsky was 59 when he died while Tolstoy lived to be 82. It shows how tough a life Dostoevsky endured, mostly in the city, while Tolstoy lived in somewhat comfortable life in the countryside. This shows in their fiction too. Dostoevsky's novels are mostly about those at the bottom of the society, from his first novel Poor Folk to his last novel The Brothers Karamazov. His characters grapple with poverty and money. While Tolstoy mostly wrote about those at the top, the nobility and the aristocrats. Of course, there are some exceptions. Dostoevsky's novel The Idiot is about an aristocrat, be it not a very rich man, whom everyone calls an idiot, while Tolstoy wrote novels about the poor as well. Tolstoy was a tall man at 5'11 or 181 centimeters, while Dostoevsky was 5'6 or 169 centimeters tall. Even the name Tolstoy in Russian means thick or fat, and his first name Leo or Lev means lion. Not sure if his name gave him much confidence or not. Fyodor means a man of God and Dostoevsky comes from a place named in the village of Dostoev in modern-day Belarus. I'm of the same height as Dostoevsky, so I can feel his pain as a short man. Speaking of pain, Dostoevsky also suffered from ill health, especially epilepsy, something he shares with so many famous novelists like Flaubert, Dickens, Poe and Dante. Tolstoy, however, had no real health issues. He was a fitness fanatic and that's why he lived to be 82 years old. Human Suffering 
both authors wrote about suffering. Dostoevsky's suffering is partly economic and partly existential. His characters are mostly poor people who are desperate for a place in the world, seeking meaning and purpose. In other words, poverty on the outside and suffering on the inside. In Crime and Punishment, Raskolnikov is a poor student who commits a crime that torments him on the inside. In Notes from Underground, the narrator hides from society where he was humiliated. In Brothers Karamazov, all the brothers suffer because they feel lost between atheism, hedonism and religion. For Dostoevsky, the cause of suffering is the breakdown of social fabrics, religious faith and the arrival of Western individualism. As a result, Russians seeking a quick fix, they adopted Western ideas like atheism, rationalism and utilitarianism. Dostoevsky acknowledges rationality being helpful in alleviating illnesses and helping the economy, but not only it was an inadequate solution to your existential crisis, it was also dangerous as it broke the old social fabrics to let individuals lose to commit terrible crimes as in Crime and Punishment and the Brothers Karamazov. Without the fear of God, anything was permissible. So for the most part, Dostoevsky blamed modernity for the moral and existential crisis of his fellow Russians, which resulted in their suffering. Tolstoy's suffering is usually because of one's failure to fulfill their duty to their family or society. In other words, Tolstoy's suffering is caused by social institutions like nation and family. War and Peace centers on warfare among nations that caused immense suffering among both the French and the Russians. Anna Karenina is about the institution of family and social norms that cause suffering. The death of Ivan Elich is about how selfishness can harm those around you. So Tolstoy's suffering is more about the failure of fulfilling your duties to your family and society. So, for Dostoevsky, it was the individual in crisis, thus he is called a psychologist, while for Tolstoy, it was society in crisis, thus considered a sociologist. Their solution to suffering also differs. Dostoevsky wanted to insulate Russia from the bad ideas coming, while Tolstoy looked to the whole humanity for an answer. Dostoevsky's answer to suffering is a kind of blind, naive love, which can be equated to religious faith, the value of simplicity and naivety that existed among the Russian peasants. This resonates with Dostoevsky's own life. His criminal conviction meant that he spent 10 years among the Russian peasants, but also affected his life and career, so he was seeking forgiveness and love no matter what mistakes you have made in the past. Dostoevsky wanted to insulate Russia from the dangers of bad ideas coming into the country. His own criminal conviction was due to Western influence. A good example is in Notes from Underground. A man goes into himself while hiding underground. Even in Crime and Punishment, Siberia is a kind of isolated place where Raskolnikov's soul can be saved. Dostoevsky was a Slavophile, passionately supported the Russian peasants to the point that some criticized him for being anti-Semitic. Dostoevsky was anti-capitalist, so as it happened, a lot of the bankers and capitalists offering loans at the time were Jewish people, and most people in debt were the Russian peasants. So Dostoevsky conflated Jewish people with capitalism or westernization. Tolstoy, however, criticized the old institutions like family and church as being outdated in need of modernization. He was excommunicated by the Russian Orthodox Church for criticizing it. Tolstoy believed in the ideals of European Enlightenment and Universalist Humanism. He even corresponded with people all around the world. Tolstoy had a more optimistic view of humans that through education, people can be molded and shaped into good beings and good citizens. So he founded several schools for the peasants and promoted pacifism around the world. Dostoevsky, on the other hand, was pessimistic about humans for being too irrational and flawed, therefore cannot be trusted if left to their own devices in the presence of bad ideas, in the company of bad friends. Dostoevsky believed there is a kind of darkness inside of us, a demon, a destructive force that leads you to do terrible things due to greed and selfishness, even damage your own lives through addiction to sex, gambling, shopping, food, alcohol or drugs. Tolstoy, however, like Rousseau, believed humans are in essence good, but it's the society that corrupts them. Writing Style Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment and the Brothers Karamazov are murder mysteries. 
Tolstoy wrote family drama. Tolstoy is a master of juxtaposing the warmth and the cold dynamics among people in families, among soldiers, friends, and even strangers. In one moment, there is a genuine feeling of comfort being with others, then there are moments you can't stand others. Dostoevsky's strength is a dramatic storytelling, while Tolstoy's strength is vivid and poetic writing. Dostoevsky's writing is quite messy, dark, spontaneous, and improvised, almost explosive. Tolstoy's writing appears a little bit more methodical, calm, and measured. Dostoevsky's characters act on their own free will, so they make terrible mistakes, irrational decisions, and often self-destruct. But they are proactive and make things happen. Tolstoy's characters, however, are more bound by social norms, family, and society. Things happen to them. Tolstoy believed social changes or historical events were not the deeds of individuals, but the whole society. So someone like Napoleon didn't steer history, but he himself was bound by history and societal forces. Tolstoy's novels have no single, but many protagonists. Dostoevsky's characters are mentally shackled and tormented, while Tolstoy's characters are socially stifled through marriage or social class. Dostoevsky's characters are victims of their own choices, while Tolstoy's characters are victims of social change and conventions. Dmitry Merezhovsky, a Russian novelist, said that Tolstoy wrote about external or earthly truths, i.e. societal truths, while Dostoevsky wrote about internal or divine truth, in other words, psychological truth. All of Dostoevsky's protagonists are men. Female characters tend to come to save the troubled men and restore their souls. In Crime and Punishment, Sonia the prostitute comes to rescue Raskolnikov. In Nudes from the Underground, Lisa almost saves the underground man. In Brothers Karamazov, female characters restore men. Tolstoy, on the other hand, gave female characters more central roles in his novels. Anna and Anna Karenina, Natasha Rostova and War and Peace are the protagonists. Tolstoy was sympathetic towards women's freedom. High society Tolstoy's main setting limited individual freedom to guard societal norms and traditions, especially women. Dostoevsky, however, was more concerned with the Russian peasants, where there were no many educated women seeking freedom. Among the Russian peasants, women worked and suffered alongside men. So there was a kind of equality there. In Tolstoy's novels, human cruelty, or perhaps the ability to be cruel, is often hidden from view, so one has to peel back a layer to find it. While in Dostoevsky's novels, human cruelty is in the open. Tolstoy's upper-class characters are very good at hiding their true selves, as they are bound by many social conventions. While Dostoevsky's lower-class characters are more like open books, even in Crime and Punishment, Raskolnikov didn't have to confess, but he did. Why? Again, that Russian honesty. Even Tolstoy agreed that the Russian peasants lived a more authentic and genuine life. In War and Peace, Pierre meets a peasant and he is spiritually liberated. In the death of Ivan Illich, Ivan learns wisdom from his servant, Gerasim. Another interesting thing you notice in Dostoevsky's novel is how lonely his protagonists are. None of his male characters are close to their families, and, and some even hate their families as they tend to be dysfunctional. In Notes from Underground, the narrator is alone inside an underground basement and mentions no family, and his friends abandon him. In Crime and Punishment, Raskolnikov is very irritated when his mother and sister show up. In the brothers Karamazov, all brothers are on each other's throat, or their father's throat, except the youngest. So you could say Dostoevsky was the writer of male loneliness. Today most people find themselves extremely isolated and the majority of men are out of sexual marketplace. Thus suicide is very high among men. Today Haruki Murakami is a writer of male loneliness. In Tolstoy's work, family bonds are strong. Therefore his characters try to be free and often unable to free themselves from their families and duties. In Anna Karenina, Anna desperately tries to divorce her husband, but fails. Dostoevsky's characters are detached from their families, while Tolstoy's characters are attached. Also, this is because of their social class. Dostoevsky's characters are predominantly people of lower socioeconomic status, while Tolstoy's characters are mostly well-off, so the family bond is tied to money, heritage, and inheritance. 
while most of Dostoevsky's characters have none of that. As a result of this freedom, Dostoevsky's characters have psychological issues, while Tolstoy's characters have social or familial issues. Of course, there are exceptions. USSR When the communists took over in Russia in 1917, they regarded the two writers somewhat differently. Tolstoy was closer to their way of looking at the world through groups, class, and communities. War and peace was given to Soviet soldiers to improve their morale and promote nationalism because it was about how the Russian spirit had overcome Napoleon a century before. Prokofiev wrote an opera on war and peace in 1946 at the height of Soviet power after defeating Hitler and consolidating Eastern Europe. Dostoevsky's individualist approach didn't fit well with the socialist way of seeing the world. But also Dostoevsky's insular views didn't fit in with the spirit of international socialism. Lenin loved Tolstoy and Stalin celebrated him. However, after Stalin, the Soviet leaders slowly returned to their Russian roots so they celebrated Dostoevsky, especially in the 1970s and onward. Today, Putin finds himself closer to Dostoevsky than Tolstoy, especially on individual freedom, that individuals cannot be trusted if left to their own devices. Having said that, both authors are read in schools and Russians love them both. Now, who is a better writer? This is a very difficult question and the answer is highly subjective. I love Dostoevsky's dark, edgy psychological novels with more drama, with his characters mostly volatile, crazy, irrational and predictable. That madness resonates with me on a deeper psychological level because I think we're all a bit volatile and irrational on the inside. By reading Dostoevsky's novel, you find a kind of release. I think if you are a happy person, you might enjoy Tolstoy, but Dostoevsky was a better writer of human suffering, in my view. Of course, Tolstoy's novel full of dramas and madness of its own kind, but for the most part, Tolstoy himself was a calm and measured man, and his novels reflect that. You could even say that Dostoevsky was slightly a better storyteller, given his chaotic characters and his focus on crime was also crucial. Crime fiction simply sells more than family drama. To find out who's more popular today, I looked at the reviews and ratings on Goodreads, which is owned by Amazon, the largest bookseller in the world, so it is perhaps an accurate picture of what people read today. If you look at them side by side, Dostoevsky edges Tolstoy on all three metrics. He has more ratings, 1.7 million compared to 1.4 million for Tolstoy, so Tolstoy has almost 400,000 fewer readers than Dostoevsky on Goodreads. It is possible that Tolstoy's readers are older people, therefore less likely to be online. The second metric is reviews. Dostoevsky with 84,000 reviews and Tolstoy with 67,000 reviews. So Dostoevsky has 17,000 more reviews. People have voted with their keyboard. Now in terms of enjoyment or getting something out of their novels, again Tolstoy with an average of 4.07, while Dostoevsky is a clear winner by 0.11 points, with an average of 4.18. I don't normally read much into ratings on Goodreads, but these are important stats. Dostoevsky resonates with people more today because of his crime genre, also perhaps his religious beliefs. I think today millions of people feel a bit lost, so his writing is deeply psychological and somewhat religious, which resonates with a lot of people seeking meaning for their lives. But perhaps the biggest thing is his dim view of humanity as petty, self-interested and self-destructive. Today we can see the most visibly an online hatred, the ruthless side of capitalism that has benefited a small minority of elite and society, and the impulsive shopping, drug addiction and obesity seen throughout the developed world. We aren't as rational as we are meant to be. So Dostoevsky got it right that rationality alone cannot solve all human problems. Tolstoy, despite his happy marriage, social guilt of being born in a rich family, lived a comfortable life. Dostoevsky, however, experienced poverty, spent years in jail in the cold, harsh Siberia. He was a convicted criminal, a lonely man, badly treated and, and suffered from epilepsy. So in all his writing, he's seeking a kind of warmth, a sense of belonging, acceptance by others, to fill a void, to not be alone. Dostoevsky was like Harry Potter, orphan without a family, spent the rest of his life seeking the warmth of a family acceptance. Tolstoy on the other hand was like Prince Harry or Lord Byron, who couldn't wait to leave his family for some freedom. 
In fact, Tolstoy spent years womanizing, drinking, gambling, just like Prince Harry. Also, at the end of his life, he did what he always wanted. He ran away from his wife, which resulted in catching pneumonia and his subsequent death at the train station, which is depicted in a 2009 movie, The Last Station. Tolstoy's fascination with train was because of a promise of escape. Anna Karenina is a good example, who falls in love with a man at the train station, witnesses a man dying and then ends her own life in front of a train. Now, if you have never read any of these authors, let me recommend where you should start. For Dostoevsky, my favorite novel is Crime and Punishment, and my favorite Tolstoy's novel is Anna Karenina. But they are pretty long novels. If you like short stories, then Dostoevsky's White Nights and Tolstoy's How Much Land Does a Man Need are perfect places to start. Both Tolstoy and Dostoevsky remain timeless because of one thing. Both told the truth. Honesty is perhaps the best policy if you want to be a novelist who stands the test of time. They were lucky because honesty is one of the most important characteristics of Russian people. To the point that people find Russians a bit rude. I say they are honest. So both Tolstoy and Dostoevsky told the raw truth, no matter how ugly, and that's why we still read them. War and Peace, considered the greatest novel of all time, was followed by his other masterpiece, Anna Karenina. Now he was the greatest Russian novelist. But in 1880s, Tolstoy renounced his novels for spreading immorality, called for a ban on sex, confessed his religious belief, and gave away his wealth. He founded schools for the peasants and started wearing peasant clothes. He even became a shoemaker. Later, he criticized organized religion by advocating a type of Christian anarchy and was swiftly expelled from the Russian Orthodox Church. Tolstoy became a pacifist which influenced Mahatma Gandhi. In 1910, he escaped his wife. While on the run, he caught cold and died at a train station. He had 13 children and 14 novels and many short stories. Today, Tolstoy stands alongside Shakespeare, Dante, Dickens and Dostoevsky. So what can we learn from him? Let's begin. Lesson 1. Heaven and Hell are other people. For Tolstoy, society is the source of our miseries but also our profoundest happiness. In all his novels, Tolstoy tried to understand an individual's place among groups, i.e. family, society or nation. Whether you are poor or rich, we all struggle with our family, church, society, or country. In War and Peace, Tolstoy chronicles the lives of five families before, during, and after Napoleon's invasion of Russia in 1812, and how social and historical events sweep individuals and change their lives forever. For Tolstoy, Napoleon, despite his power, was at the mercy of social events beyond his control, as we are at the mercy of groups, our family, neighborhood, city, and country, and today the whole world. Tolstoy's characters in War and Peace find their families a source of their misery as well as joy. The novel is full of scenes of incredible joy, be it in camaraderie among soldiers, friendship among people, and relationships among partners. Society causes us immense pain, but also provides us with pleasure by comforting, nourishing, and supporting us. But Tolstoy says society is made up of individuals, just as human body is made up of cells. In other words, each individual contributes to the social and historical events, just as a drop of water adds to the ocean. In other words, each individual soldier makes a difference in major wars. So society and groups, despite causing many ills, are also the source of immense joy in our lives. And each individual is responsible for such misery and joy. Lesson 2. Embrace Imperfection After society, our own beliefs are our worst enemy. Quote, it was evident that he had long been convinced that it was impossible for him to make a mistake, that in his perception whatever he did was right, not because it harmonized with any idea of right or wrong, because he did it. Tolstoy's novel Anna Karenina is about a married woman who abandons her husband and child for a handsome officer. 
Initially, it's society, her circle of friends and family that punishes her transgression, but she can fight them off. Then, once she attains her goal of having the officer to herself, she starts worrying about losing him, which leads her to extreme jealousy and paranoia that lead her to suicide. Anna believes in perfect happiness and perfect partner in a perfect world. That belief led her to obsess and self-destruct. Our mind wanders in search of ideals and perfection, but it is stuck in an imperfect physical body. Tolstoy says instead of pursuing our own hedonistic pleasures or seeking perfection in life, we should seek fulfillment in our duties towards others, our family, partner, customer, friends, and so forth. Quote, if you look for perfection, you will never be content. Lesson 3. The greatest joy is when you make others happy, not yourself. Tolstoy believes one's life purpose should be to serve others. Family plays an important role in all Tolstoy's writing. One could say his entire body of work is about family. War and Peace, despite its title, is a family saga. Anna Karenina, too, is about family. The death of Ivan Illich is about family. In all these novels, individual characters, in pursuit of their happiness, abandon and destroy their family, but only to realize that grass is never greener on the other side. Tolstoy believes we are happiest when we make others happy. Modern neuroscience studies tend to agree with Tolstoy that while giving, our brain releases happy chemicals. Throughout our lives, we receive from others, from our parents, teachers, friends, and strangers in terms of knowledge, skills, financial, and emotional support. So shifting our mind from gaining things to giving things can give your life a deeper meaning. When Tolstoy was 50, he gave away his wealth and founded schools for the peasants, so he believed in education as the best gift to any human being. Quote, Love is the only way to rescue humanity from all ills. Lesson 4. Art is Therapeutic Tolstoy dedicated his life to writing and storytelling. In an essay, What is Art?, Tolstoy says that art can make us kinder and can bring people together. Quote, Universal art, by uniting the most different people in one common feeling, by destroying separation, will educate people to union. Will show them not by reason, but by life itself, the joy of universal union reaching beyond the bounds set by life. His novels have been the source of immense pleasure for millions of people over the decades and centuries. For Tolstoy, science cannot replace art because they offer different things. Science brings physical comfort for us through medicine and technology, but art gives us emotional and psychological nourishment through stories. We need both, just like children need both parents to grow up in a healthy environment. Science is a product of reason that provides us with security and provisioning, and art is a product of emotions and passion that offers us meaning and purpose. It is through stories that we learn our deepest values in life. So art penetrates where science cannot reach to steer our feelings, to inspire us to be greater than our own selves. Lesson 5. Death gives life a meaning. In the death of Ivan Illich, Tolstoy tells the story of a successful man of high society who suddenly falls ill and faces an imminent death. He is terrified and asks why a good man like him should suffer such terrible pain. The fear of death is like a terrifying shadow in the family, but his servant, Gurasim, is the only one who is not afraid of death. With the help of Gurasim, Ivan realizes that his life's goal has always been run by selfish pursuit. Gurasim, however, lives an authentic life characterized by compassion. At the end, Ivan wishes to die soon to release his family of the burden of putting up with him. Ivan is no longer afraid of death, and that's when death itself disappears, because death is nothing but fear. The novel is partly Epicurean, who said that since we don't know death, we have nothing to fear, and partly Buddhist, that the more we achieve in life, the harder it is to part with our worldly possessions. Tolstoy suggests the purpose of death is to make us bigger than our selfish pursuits. Death is there to teach us compassion. Lesson 6. We all have our contradictions. Tolstoy says it's a mistake to equate every individual as right or wrong 
good or evil because we all have our flaws and strengths. Quote, one of the most widespread superstition is that every man has his own special definite qualities. That a man is kind, cruel, wise, stupid, energetic, apathetic, etc. Men are not like that. Men are like rivers. The water is the same in each and alike in all. But every river is narrow here, is more rapid there, here slower, there broader, now clear, now cold, now dull, now warm. It is the same with men. Every man carries in himself the germs of every human quality and sometimes one manifests itself, sometimes another. And the man often becomes unlike himself, while still remaining the same man. Tolstoy's characters are not villains or heroes, but ordinary humans who struggle to find their paths in life. And in the process, make mistakes, amend those mistakes, contradict themselves and face the consequences, often tragic. Everyone wants to be loved, happy and appreciated. Sometimes we do dumb things in the process. The ability to be good is often a privilege in terms of means and application we have at our disposal. Tolstoy was young when his mother died and he tells us that he tormented himself for thinking he was a bad person because he couldn't cry at his mother's funeral. Lesson 7. It's better to be good than great. Tolstoy believed great men of history are more like fictional characters made into great heroes by historians. Reading about them creates a feeling of envy, so we try to emulate them. In other words, we contribute to their greatness by accepting at a face value. Not only that, we often ignore their misbehaviors or transgression. By participating in this narrative, we perpetuate it. To illustrate this, Tolstoy tells us how a single company, the British East India Company, could rule a vast country like India. Quote, a commercial company with 30,000 men, not athletes, but rather weak and ordinary people, have subdued 200 million vigorous, clever, capable, and freedom-loving people. It's not the English who have enslaved the Indians, but the Indians who have enslaved themselves how they have done so by participating in the enslavement of their own people, just as we participate in the narrative around the myth of great men. Tolstoy says that these so-called great men are often petty and small in their everyday lives like everyone else, and often very unhappy because so many things are out of their control. Quote, in historic events, the so-called great men are labels giving names to events, and like labels they have, but the smallest connection with the events itself. In other words, no matter how great, you are not above human condition. You suffer the same. For Tolstoy, great or not great depends on how you treat others. Quote, there is no greatness where simplicity, goodness, and truth are absent. Lesson 8. Life is a dream. In Tolstoy's short story, How Much Land Does a Man Need? A landowner wants to sell land. The condition is, for a fixed amount of money, anyone can claim as large as an area they want. But they must stake the land in one single day. Back home, the protagonist gets greedy and attempts to stake an enormous area of land. And by sunset, he manages to circle his way back, but he has exhausted himself. He collapses and dies. So the answer to how much land does a man need, Tolstoy says, six feet of land was all that he needed. Pokham is buried there. It is society that complicates life for us by promoting greed, so it is our own job to simplify our lives. Tolstoy struggled in his own life, especially with sex. In his novel, The Devil, a man commits suicide after falling in love with a second woman, which leads to his dilemma. Leave his wife, kill his wife, or kill himself. He decides to kill himself. In Kreutzer Sonata, sex leads to a murder. For most men, sex is their biggest demon. Tolstoy at one point advocated sex should be banned and even humanity should be eradicated. But Tolstoy was also influenced by Arthur Schopenhauer, the German philosopher, who under the influence of Buddhism argued that life is nothing but suffering. This inspired Tolstoy to simplify his life. He gave away his wealth to the poor, wore simple clothes and started making his own shoes. Quote, 
If you want to be happy, be. Tolstoy says, as long as we live, we have the chance to be happy. For Tolstoy, life is a dream, so live it to the fullest before waking up. When you think of Russian literature, Tolstoy's name is the most natural that comes to mind. Despite his upper-class upbringing, he was a humanist through and through. You can see a deep connection between his worldview and the egalitarian social system that took over Russia a few centuries later. But obviously Tolstoy was far more idealistic in his philosophy. He wanted a society where people tended to their lands and some kind of bygone utopia where people had a deep connection with the soil. As a result, he's often considered a sociologist who wanted to understand how we function as a society. As we saw, Tolstoy's writing was incredibly realistic compared to Dickens' somewhat fairy tale of modern England. Tolstoy also had that Russian pessimism that permeates even today. We saw how fatalistic he was in his novel War and Peace. For example, when faced with history, individuals are powerless. In his novel Anna Karenina, Tolstoy shows that society is a source of our happiness but also our miseries. One of the biggest challenges we all face is how to balance between our own individual happiness and our duties towards our family and community. Tolstoy struggled with life's meaning, but that struggle captures the true meaning of life. It's a struggle. There's no one recipe for everyone, so some of the life lessons we learn can give us a new perspective on life. Finally, we understood how Tolstoy and the other giant of Russian literature, Dostoevsky, were so similar yet so different. Dostoevsky wrote about the individual from an individual point of view, while Tolstoy leaned more towards the collective. Dostoevsky wrote about the outsiders in society, while Tolstoy wrote about the ruling elite. At the end of the day, Russian literature is not complete without understanding and reading Tolstoy. I hope this video helped you understand the man and his writings. What do you think? Have you read any of his books? What is your favorite Tolstoy novel? Please leave a comment down below. As always, thank you for accompanying me on this very long journey. Спасибо большое.